Knock knock. Who are you? Kayla. Go who? Kayla Christensen. Wait, who's Kayla Christensen? I don't know. Our first speaker today is Kayla Christensen. Oh, tell me more. Kayla is an SLP at the Weisman Center and at Gigi's Playhouse, a Down Syndrome Achievement Center here in Madison. Well, what is an SLP? SLP is a special and loving person. SLP. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Some people would call her a speech and language pathologist, but that is a mouthful. Okay. Please welcome Kayla, our favorite SLP. Good morning. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, I really appreciate that. And I'm so glad that Judy and Matthew showed me that this morning before I went on because I needed to be prepared for that kindness. Thank you, Matthew. So like Matthew said, my name is Kayla Christensen, and I'm a speech-language pathologist. And I'm so excited to be talking with you today about maximizing communication gains, putting the fun and functional speech and language therapy for individuals with Down syndrome. I received my undergraduate and graduate degrees in speech-language pathology um, from UW-Madison, and I was also fortunate to complete a year of training in the Wisconsin LEND program. I completed my clinical fellowship and worked as a certified speech-language pathologist in the Wiseman Center clinics, including the Down syndrome clinic, as well as the newborn follow-up, feeding, autism, and neuromotor clinics. And I currently work as a speech-language pathologist in the Communication Aids and Systems Clinic at the Wiseman Center, as well as in the Amina Grace Speech and Language Program at Gigi's Playhouse Down Syndrome Achievement Center. <laughs> um, and I also help support study coordination for the Assessment of Early Intervention Outcomes Research Project for Children with Hearing Loss in Wisconsin. The spirit of this talk focuses on shared expertise how collaboration between individuals with Down syndrome, families, team members, and speech-language pathologists can help maximize communication gains, um, as well as how this collaboration can promote fun and functional speech and language therapy. So I wanted to start by saying thank you to all of the individuals um, listed on this slide. Uh, and in the words of the little blue truck, we all need a helping hand and a few good friends, and I feel so lucky to have that. And I'm really looking forward to learning from all of you today. So to start, we'll outline some terms that will pop up during today's talk. Uh, receptive language refers to language understanding, like following directions or responding to certain words. Expressive language refers to language production, like making sentences. I like to think of core words as sentence building words that go across multiple activities um, like action words, describing words, pronouns. With aided language stimulation, um, you're showing how to pair a written word, picture, sign, or symbol with your speech to support language understanding and expression. And I'm breezing through these pretty quick, but you guys will have the slides too and, and we'll talk more about them. Um, we all use a multimodal communication strategy to communicate. This refers to um, the use of multiple strategies to connect with another person, such as the use of speech uh, with gestures, written language, sign language, pictures, symbols. Joint attention is sharing attention with another person, um, attending to what they're looking at or pointing to or showing you. And lastly, code switching involves recognizing how your partner communicates and using that information to select your mode or languages of communication. Uh, for example, a bilingual speaker of Spanish and English will use her English with partners who understand English, Spanish with partners who understand Spanish, and both languages with partners who understand Spanish and English. 
I hope to target our first learning objective here within the first several slides, and then the next three objectives within the context of three individuals with Down syndrome. Um, and I'm excited to be reviewing research today uh, that has been helpful in shaping our approach to assessment and intervention for individuals with Down syndrome. As we chat about the studies, you'll find the names of the authors and the year of publication on the slide. And while I'll be brief in my review of the studies today, there's a reference list at the end of the talk for those who also like to do a deeper dive into the research. So one of my favorite aspects of my clinical training so far has been working within an interdisciplinary team um, and seeing the benefits of ongoing team communication. One benefit as an SLP is increasing my own understanding of the individual through team communication, like requesting a client's audiogram to better understand how a hearing loss can impact speech sound production. These across team conversations also have the benefit of increasing other team members' understanding of the individual's unique communication profile. And lastly, ongoing team communication can increase the identification of existing communication opportunities and next steps, like ways to um, increase the individual's success, ways to stretch these opportunities, and ways to identify new opportunities. And it's also so important to highlight that there are no negative effects on speech or language skills associated with bilingualism for individuals with Down syndrome, just like with the general population. So as a speech language pathologist, I recommend exposure in all languages spoken by the family. Uh, I think it's such an awesome way to increase communication opportunities both within the family and across the community. So next, we'll describe communication considerations for three individuals with Down syndrome, Martha, Tyler, and Carl, to identify how fun and functional treatment was achieved with consideration of Rosin's integrated treatment model, comprehensive assessment, review of the available literature, and ongoing team communication. In all of these examples, we'll break down four major principles from Rosin and Miolo's integrated treatment model for individuals with Down syndrome. So first, we'll begin with Martha, a two-year-old girl with Down syndrome who loves play-based activities, listening to music, creating art, and being with her family. Martha completed formal and informal play-based speech and language assessment, and her mother provided parent report measures of expressive vocabulary. Martha presented with many wonderful communication strengths, including understanding one and two step directions, and a large strength in her joint attention, um, including pointing, giving, showing. Based on Martha's assessment and her family's priorities for therapy, goals were set around increasing speech sound production and expressive vocabulary. <clears throat> To begin selecting evidence-based teaching strategies for Martha, it was important to turn to the available literature, especially for areas of need identified for individuals with Down syndrome. Um, I really love these authors' reflection on the variability of uh, communication skills demonstrated by individuals with Down syndrome. It really highlights the need to always pair information from our evidence base with comprehensive assessment of the individual's unique communication profile. The vocabulary inventory completed by Martha's mother highlighted that Martha's vocabulary was primarily nouns, and this aligns with study findings to focus on core vocabulary and grammatical markers, as early vocabularies for children with Down syndrome tend to include higher proportions of nouns. After pairing our uh, review of the literature with our understanding of Martha's unique communication profile, we identified aided language stimulation, or pairing a visual with a sound or word as an evidence-based teaching strategy. And we trialed a range of visual strategies to pair with Martha's speech, and identified use of gestures, American Sign Language, and use of a speech-generating device as a best fit for Martha, a total communication strategy. Uh, and when identifying the speech-generating device that best fit Martha, we also considered Martha's future expressive language needs and selected a system that had a clear path forward for language development, especially support for understanding and use of grammatical markers. These tools also directly addressed a second area of need, a challenge with verbal short-term memory. 
Pairing a visual with speech was a way to leverage a relative strength in visual spatial memory. So Martha was able to continue referencing a gesture, a sign, a written word, a symbol, even if she had a challenge holding a word in her short-term memory. Martha also used her strengths in receptive language and joint attention to quickly reference the clinicians and her mother's use of signs and symbols. And Martha was soon showing us that she could understand and use uh, core vocabulary words, such as signing and selecting the symbol for where, when she could not find her sucker. <laughs> These tools also allowed us to draw on Rosin's integrated treatment recommendation to address challenges across multiple communication domains. So, for example, we paired practice of the sound B or B with finding the letter B on our talker. This allowed us to target domains of speech, language, and literacy. <clears throat> Martha continued to impress us with her use of a multimodal communication strategy, including during art. When she selected supplies and colors to make a painting using her speech, symbols, and signs. When she directed the clinician where to hang up the pieces of art, using gestures pointing up or down, saying the word up, using symbols for next to, under, and finally, when the clinician was modeling describing words to talk about a painting, Martha spontaneously used her speech generating device, selecting pretty, and using her speech to say mama with a look towards her mother. And what a fun, joyful way to use your communication skills to tell your mother that she's pretty. Martha's mother celebrated that aided language stimulation provided Martha with tools to use with her speech she noted that having multiple strategies to repair breakdowns um, meant that communication partners were more often talking directly to Martha and not looking immediately to her mother to clarify a breakdown. And what was most fun and functional for Martha was using these strategies to be, um, with her speech, to be the real leader of her communication and connection with others. So now we'll transition to Tyler, a teen with Down syndrome. One of Tyler's main interests is playing games, the goofier the better. Tyler completed formal and informal speech and language assessment and his family completed parent report measures of communication skills. Tyler demonstrated a strength in receptive language and was motivated to connect with others, especially through his great sense of humor. Two of Tyler's primary needs included increasing fluency of speech and expanding expressive language skills. Based on Tyler's assessment and his family's priorities for therapy, goals were set around increasing speech intelligibility and supporting home practice of speech and language goals. Individuals with Down syndrome demonstrate a much higher prevalence of disfluency or stuttering compared to the general population. Um, for example, 10 to 45% for individuals with Down syndrome compared to 1% in the general population. And while individuals with Down syndrome have a relatively high prevalence of disfluency, there's a relatively small number of studies uh, investigating treatment for stuttering for individuals with Down syndrome. So when searching for evidence-based strategies, we found it helpful to seek out descriptive reports on single individuals and then to use dynamic assessment to check in on Tyler's response to these fluency shaping techniques. So we would assess Tyler's fluency during conversation, teach a fluency shaping strategy, and then reassess Tyler's fluency. Tyler was motivated to practice strategies targeting increased fluency within role play of community-based communication opportunities. And it was crucial to partner with Tyler and his family to identify what community opportunities were relevant to their family. For example, ordering at a restaurant, making pizza at home, um, asking a police officer for help, and after trialing several strategies to support increased fluency, Tyler started to show the most benefit from use of pacing strategies, reminders to use slow, clear speech, and tapping out syllables. Tyler also benefited from use of visual scripts to expand his verbal sentence building. Uh, additionally, Tyler's rate of speech was slower while reading, um, which allowed for extra opportunities to reinforce that slow, clear speech. And, uh, this pairing of fluency strategies with sentence building uh, also allowed us to target those multiple communication domains. 
Additionally, communication with Tyler's school speech language pathologist revealed that use of visual scripts, uh, written words, pictures in the school setting helped to reduce uh, language processing demands in later practice for Tyler. Tyler also benefited from a clear understanding of what we were going to be doing in our speech and language uh, therapy session, as well as clear expectations about the length of games and practice. Tyler's parents were really instrumental in working with the clinician um, to create these visuals, pictured on the slide as a blend between a visual schedule and a behavior chart, where Tyler could check off um, boxes as we completed uh, practice or turns in a game. And these visuals were also really helpful to support home practice of goals. So for Tyler, fun and functional speech and language therapy involved motivating community practice opportunities, increasing his speech intelligibility by decreasing the number of times that he got stuck repeating part of a word, and a clear understanding of expectations for practice of speech and language goals. Lastly, we have Carl, an adult with Down syndrome, who completed formal and informal assessment uh, for speech and language. He presented with many wonderful communication strengths, including social language, uh, language understanding, use of a multimodal communication strategy, and based on his assessment and Carl and Carl's mother's priorities for therapy, goals were set around increasing speech intelligibility by targeting speech sound production and motor planning. One day, Carl made a reference to work in therapy, and Carl's mother provided extra context that Carl was upset because his use of a loud voice at work meant that he was not receiving 10 out of 10 stars at the end of the day. We then made the decision to add a goal around identifying vocal volume using visual supports pictured on the slide. We adapted a volume meter scale using input um, from the clinician, Carl's mother, and Carl. We then sent a draft of the volume meter scale um, to work to uh, get input from Carl's vocational team. We wanted to make sure that the language on the scale, no voice, quiet voice, talking voice, loud voice, was consistent with how um, the vocational team had been discussing vocal volume. And with input from his team, we changed the scale to best support use in the work setting. In therapy, we worked on identifying the voice that different people were using, um, and also used symbols for different settings to identify what voice we would use. Uh, for example, um, in a movie theater, we would use no voice while the movie was going. In the library, we would use a quiet voice. In the car, we would use a talking voice. And in the park, maybe we would use a loud voice if we were calling to a friend. We utilized evidence-based strategies of providing visuals for abstract language and embedding these visuals within routine-based contexts. Carl increased his ability to self-monitor his vocal volume uh, and to make a judgment about what voice he would use in a specific setting. Additionally, he started to pull out the scale on his own um, to comment on the voice that he was using. And most important of all, he used the volume scale at work and was getting 10 stars at the end of his work days. And this was so exciting and motivating for Carl. It was definitely a way to put the fun in functional speech and language therapy. So to summarize, we'll circle back um, on our learning objectives and highlight possible takeaways for each individual. For team communication benefits, Martha's family provided invaluable feedback about the use of a multimodal communication strategy. Tyler and his family provided crucial information about meaningful community practice opportunities, and his school SLP shared ways that they were also benefiting from the use of visual supports. Carl and his mother highlighted a need that was outside of the established goals, but that was definitely related to speech intelligibility um, and was impacting Carl's quality of life. Carl, his mother, and his vocational team also provided critical information during the creation and implementation of the vocal volume scale. When identifying communication considerations, we definitely saw a benefit of pairing a review of the literature with individualized speech and language assessment as well as addressing challenges across multiple communication domains, um, like speech, language, literacy, fluency, and incorporating strengths and interests. For Martha, um, and this really looked different for each individual, uh, for Martha, using aided language stimulation and a multimodal communication strategy was helpful to provide a rich context for language learning and expression. For Tyler, pairing fluency shaping strategies with expressive language supports was a best fit. 
And for Carl, pairing speech sound intervention techniques with a visual support for monitoring vocal volume provided the most benefit. When considering communication opportunities across environments, ongoing uh, communication between teams was super helpful. Um, additionally, the composition of teams changed with age and needs. Um, so for Martha, we focused on home and community settings with familiar and unfamiliar partners. For Tyler, we focused on the same with the addition of reaching out to a school setting. And for Carl, we focused on home, community settings, and work. Lastly, when identifying supports to generalize skills across environments, Martha benefited from use of that multimodal communication strategy so that she could code switch between different partners. Um, she could use her speech and signs with partners who understood signs. She could use her speech, gestures, and symbols with partners who did not know sign. Tyler benefited from the use of visual schedules, behavior charts, and communication with various team members. And lastly, Carl benefited from the use of a visual to generalize his skills of monitoring his vocal volume, as well as communication with his teams. In summary, strategies to maximize communication gains and promote fun and functional speech and language therapy are definitely interrelated. Um, and since what is fun and motivating for one individual can be different for the next, I would encourage you to consider how these strategies can relate to you and your team uh, consider ways that your team can work together to support practice with specific communication goals. For example, if your goal is around using your speech, signs, uh, and symbols to introduce yourself, how could that look with a new friend, at an IEP meeting, or at Day with the Experts? Uh, thank you again for that great introduction, Matthew. Lastly, communication is all about connection. Think of our little blue truck. We all need a helping hand and a few good friends. And I wanted to thank you all for your time and attention. And I would love to answer any questions that you have. Uh, and those are yes, my we have a microphone, so if you have a question, just raise your hand. I haven't formulated the question yet. Um, so my son is 21 and his speech has just gone mm. and it takes 40 minutes to answer a question sometimes. Mm. Um, 20 is, you know, normal. Um, and I'm not knowing what to do. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, that sounds like it's... Uh, been distressing for you guys and, and for your son too. Um, I would uh, encourage you are, you, are you guys connected with speech and language services now? He's in the public school so they have, but it, it's not therapy, it's just a stop in at the job and gotcha. okay. um, but we are going to get back with a speech therapist we had years ago. Oh, great. I think that's so exciting. Um, yeah. Uh, and I would definitely encourage you when you're reconnecting with that speech language pathologist uh, to connect her uh, or him with your team too to see are there any strategies at school or at work where they're seeing a, a benefit of um, pairing like a, a visual if you're breaking down an activity and, and listing out the steps or offering different choices? Well, the, the uh, speech therapist just put on his phone huh. a, an app cool. that would speak for him. Mm -hmm. But yeah. that's just recent. I think that um, uh, definitely pairing visuals with speech can be a really nice strategy for a lot of individuals. And um, uh, two, I would chat with your speech language pathologist uh, I would recommend assessment with several different, um, you can do communication applications or dedicated speech generating devices so that you make sure that you're finding the system that's the best fit for your individual. Um, and I love pairing uh, that assessment with um, comprehensive assessment of speech and language too to see 
Maybe there's some challenges with um, formulation of expressive language, like pairing words together, and, and maybe having some goals around that could help support that communication back and forth. Yeah, I would uh, encourage you to, to reach out to that SLP. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Yeah, I have a question in terms yeah. of how early to start uh, using a, an iPad for communication. Do you start with pictures and then move into that or, or simultaneously? Yeah, that's a great question. I love to pair um, uh, speech with other modes of communication, whether that's sign, pictures, written words, symbols. Um, and really, I, I feel that there isn't like too early of an age to start that. Um, so you're building off of those joint attention skills where the individual is able to attend to what you're saying, what you're pointing to, whether that's a real object or a symbol or a picture. So um, they're able to build that connection with you um, that this, this word um, can be uh, represented uh, verbally, it can be represented through a symbol, it can be represented through an object for some concrete things, more, more nouns. Um, but yeah, I would recommend starting uh, at any age and just seeking out that really comprehensive assessment to make sure that you're finding a strategy that best matches the individual strengths and areas of need. Yeah, Kayla, I'm wondering if you would please, uh, let's say a family decides they, uh, they, they notice that we have a speech at the Amini Gray Speech and Language Program at, uh, at Gigi's Playhouse, and that family comes in to see you. Can you talk a little bit about exactly what that first session would look like and what it is that you do? Sure. Yeah, so um, I would say in any setting when uh, you're first meeting with your speech-language pathologist, um, you would want to be looking for some really nice comprehensive assessment that's both direct assessment where the speech-language pathologist is um, completing tasks with um, the individual coming in for therapy, as well as seeking information from parents, caregivers, and other settings. Um, so they're really able to integrate all that information together because we know um, when you're in a new setting with a new communication partner, sometimes that communication can look really different than what communication looks like at home. So um, I would recommend comprehensive assessment, uh, chatting with teams too, um, and then I like to reach out to families before we meet in person too, so I can learn more about what the individual is interested in, what their real communication strengths are, so we can start building off of those right away and, and make speech and language assessment and therapy really fun uh, and, and really about a connection because that's what communication is about. And the second follow-up to that, if, yeah. if, uh, if they, they come to you at Gigi's Playhouse, what is the charge for that? Oh, um, and I believe that there's going to be a table um, all about Gigi's Playhouse. Is that right, Eli? Okay. Um, yep. So um, what I super love about Gigi's Playhouse is that all the services are free for families, which is amazing and, and unique. And I would enc encourage you to learn more about that, yeah, at the, the table. We'll take one more question. I know, Joe, do you have a question? Cool. So my daughter's two and a half, and we just recently started her on a talker device. Cool. She's got uh, really high receptive language, but mm -hmm. not any vocabulary yet. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> she does do a really good job communicating what she needs. Mm -hmm. So she likes the talker. She knows what it does and how to use it. Mm -hmm. But we're having a little bit of trouble getting her to integrate it into her play or eating or bedtime mm -hmm. because she already knows what she wants, yeah. and she knows how to tell us. Yeah. So what would be kind of a strategy for getting her more interested in using it regularly? I think that is such a great question because with you guys, with her really familiar communication partners, maybe she's feeling like, you you know. Oh, no, I know. Well, I, I was just thinking that um, I would try to target ways to extend those current communication opportunities. So, for example, if she is approximating like um, a word for bath, for the, the bath time routine, and she's, you know, I know that you know when I say this, I mean bath. Um, I like to target ways to extend that. So um, taking a next step like, ooh, in our bath, are we going to do warm water or cold water? Well, let's not do cold. That would be too cold. Um, 
and they're bringing in uh, maybe more functions of communication too. I, I find that really motivating. So um, if she's using it really well to request with her speech um, and, and gestures and all her other strategies, I would recommend um, really zooming in focus on like social communication, commenting about when things are really silly um, or funny, um, bringing in more describing words like that cold or warm or talking about if she's requesting something, like it's fun to request something, but it's even more fun to say like, that is my favorite, like I love bubbles. <laughs> um, so maybe looking at some ways to expand and build off what she's currently doing could be helpful. Yeah, no problem, thank you. Thank you, Kayla. Oh, thank you guys so much. Let's give a warm welcome for our next speaker, uh, Segan Hartley. Well, great. Well, I am honored to be here today and so excited to learn from everyone in the audience. Um, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about some research that we're doing on Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. So um, a little bit of background about what Alzheimer's disease is. Um, this is the most common and well-described type of dementia, but there are several other types of dementias. And by dementia, we mean that this is a progressive um, decline in cognitive functioning. So a thing, um, so these would be things like including a loss in memory skills, um, decision-making skills, processing speed, and eventually that's going to then extend to motor skills and things like um, the ability to swallow and carry out everyday living um, activities. And we know that with Alzheimer's disease, we see a very um, a pattern of neurodegeneration in the brain that goes along with this progression of loss of skills. Um, with Alzheimer's disease, we say that about 5 million Americans um, have Alzheimer's disease. In Wisconsin, that would be um, over 100,000 adults. The prevalence we know will increase, and this is because of the aging baby boomer population. And right now, it's, it's, it's usually, when you look across papers, people will say it's about the seventh leading cause of death. Now, in terms of Alzheimer's disease, right now there is no cure. So we don't have a medication or a way that we can retract that neurodegeneration that we see going on in the brain. Um, there are FDA-approved medications, and a lot of these medications are really aimed at treating the symptoms, so helping with agitation and keeping the individual sort of calm, helping with some behaviors and other issues that may go along with it. And then there, um, there are also some, several classes of medications that are trying to be aimed at slowing the progression of the disease. Um, and so these are things like Aricep that we see. But it is um, very clear in the field that we need to make some more advancements in how we could perhaps treat this disease. And ideally, not only do we want to just treat it once it's already begun, but other ways that we could actually delay the onset or even prevent this condition from occurring. So let me switch a minute to Down syndrome. So for, for many of you in the room today, you know that Down syndrome um, is most commonly associated with having a third copy of chromosome 21. So instead of having 46 chromosomes like the um, majority of individuals have, individuals with Down syndrome have 47 chromosomes. And this third copy of chromosome 21 is associated with a host of phenotypic or um, differences in appearance as well as differences in physical traits and, and aspects such as um, low muscle tone. Um, it's, it's associated with intellectual disability, often in a mild or moderate range, as well as a profile of other specific difficulties in things like memory and language um, that Kayla talked about, and it's also associated with health conditions. So there's a lot of um, heart problems early on in life, thyroid disorders, we see a bunch of other um, health impairments going on, that we think is all linked to having the third copy of chromosome 21. We also think that having a, a third copy of chromosome 21 is linked to an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. So in the general population, having Alzheimer's disease is pretty rare before the age of 50. 
we see a very low incidence. Um, estimates range, but about 5 to 10% of adults, if you look at the population of 65 and older, would have Alzheimer's disease. And it's then going to increase such that if you look at individuals who are in their 80s, 90s, and beyond, it gets to be about 15 to 30%. Now in Down syndrome, we see an increased risk. So more people with Down syndrome are gonna get this disease than in the general population. And we see that it occurs much earlier on in life than we see for the general population. So again, estimates are gonna vary, but about 9% of adults with Down syndrome will show clinically significant Alzheimer's disease symptoms in their 40s, about a third in their 50s, and about half, we say, by the time they reach their 60s and their 70s. But I also want to say that also means that half do not have Alzheimer's disease in their 60s and 70s. So it's by no means the case that everyone goes on to develop clinically significant symptoms, although we do see brain changes um, you know, virtually across the entire population if you're going to image brains of individuals in their 40s and 50s. So the, this increased risk, again, as we think is related to chromosome 21, and that's because there is a gene on chromosome 21 the amyloid beta precursor protein gene, or APP. You can see it here. And this gene codes for, a, for the production of a protein called amyloid beta. And the accumulation of amyloid beta, this protein in the brain, is one of these early sort of um, changes in the brain that, then, that that leads to a cascading effects of other changes, which then results in what we think is Alzheimer's disease. And so adults with Down syndrome are, are overproducing this protein. And so that is what we think is causing this early onset and increased risk for Alzheimer's disease in the Down syndrome population. So here are some images from um, someone else who has these beautiful scans of, of what we can see if you look in the brain. So here um, we can see an image of somebody who um, is, is healthy, doesn't have Alzheimer's disease. And you can see nice neurons here that are intact. They have nice clear pathways for synapses to communicate. Here you can see this is an image of someone who would have Alzheimer's disease. So these are what we call this. This is this plaque of this, this protein called amyloid beta, which is one thing we're very interested in tracking. And what you can see is this is like a sticky protein, and these fragments cluster together. And the problem is, is that this is going to interfere with these different neurons from communicating. And eventually, it's going to cause the neurons to die, and it's going to cause this other cascading effects of, of changes in the brain. Now, this is sort of thought to be one of the earliest markers or things that we think goes awry to lead to Alzheimer's disease. But another important marker um, are these tangles of another protein called tau. And so these also are going to cluster together and, again, interfere with neurons from doing their, their normal functioning and from communicating with one another. And so just to sort of, um, oh, this color you can't quite show here, but um, if you think about, and again, we think that these changes actually are occurring prior to the onset of, of Alzheimer's disease, and I'll show you that in a minute. But if you look at, the, the, if you look at um, from our study, which is shown here in this first bar, um, we see that if you image people who don't have Alzheimer's disease yet, so these are adults with Down syndrome, about 25% show elevated levels of amyloid beta in their brain already in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. If you compare this to the general population, here, you know, this is um, about 30% of adults would in their 70s. And I want to sort of highlight that um, all of us are going to have an increase in amyloid beta as we age. Um, and a lot of us, this is sort of more of a subtle thing that's never going to actually lead to Alzheimer's disease, but we all show an increase of it over time with age. But that increased risk is going to happen a lot sooner, and it's going to happen um, uh, for adults with Down syndrome, where we see it in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. So this is a figure that shows the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So um, really, when individuals are cognitively healthy, here we have our neurons, our neurons are, um, have good integrity, they're intact, we have low levels of these amyloid beta plaques, and we have low levels of that other protein that I was talking about, this neuro, these neurofibrillary tangles of tau. And what we think happens is that as amyloid beta plaques increase, we then get this increase in neurofibrillary tangles of tau, and then the neuron integrity or function of our neurons is going to go down. Now, what I want to highlight is that we actually think all this stuff is happening years to decades before anyone's going to have symptoms of, of Alzheimer's disease. 
So in a lot of ways, it's not surprising that our medications are not really that effective, right? We're intervening um, years to decades after all these brain changes have already occurred. So one of the, the goals of our research is to better understand these really early years when we think these brain changes are actually happening for adults with Down syndrome so that we can better understand, assess, and know how to sort of intervene and treat individuals to perhaps delay the onset or even prevent the development of, from the, of the disease from occurring. So um, our study, we refer to it as the NIAID study. So it stands for Neurodegeneration and Aging Down Syndrome. And again, our main goal is to really track these really early changes in the brain prior to the development of, of Alzheimer's disease so we can better understand how is the disease developing, um, when could we intervene, um, also some of that variability. Again, I mentioned that not everyone with Down syndrome goes on to develop Alzheimer's disease type of dementia. And so we want to understand what are some of the factors that may predict why certain individuals go on to develop it, certain don't, certain individuals may develop it in their 50s, while others may not develop it until their mid-60s. And then we want to know what are some accurate early screeners, right? I mean, ideally what we want to use this for is that we can roll out a set of measures for clinicians and caregivers to use so they can begin to track and understand what, why, when somebody might be beginning this process really early on when we might have a much better chance at intervening with the medication um, to hopefully delay the onset of, of symptoms. So this is a study that's done in partnership with um, colleagues here at the, the Waisman Center, and I'll, I'll show you the team shortly. Um, the University of Cambridge in the UK, as well as the University of Pittsburgh. So for our study, this is a two-day two visit to the Waisman Center. So individuals will come in and we do our brain imaging. So this is an MRI and PET scan where we can look at the structure of the brain. And then we're gonna do, use some imaging agents so then we can track um, how much amyloid beta and tau and other biomarkers of neurodegeneration that we're seeing. Um, and just to sort of show you what this means, the imaging agent that, agent that we use to track amyloid beta, we refer to as PIG, PIB, it stands for Pittsburgh Compound B. And so if individuals, here you can see an adult with Down syndrome who, in our study, who when you look at their brain, they have very high levels of amyloid beta. So the, um, as you get to more red, you, you see higher levels of this protein. Um, as you get to more blue and yellow, you see lower levels. So here will be an adult in our study who has very high levels, and both of these individuals do not have dementia yet. Um, and this would be an individual who has very low levels. So now we can begin to track the change in this amyloid beta um, and how it's gonna be linked to some of our markers of memory and functioning um, and other indicators. Excuse me. So the second day of the visit is, is where we do a lengthy um, battery of neuropsychological assessments. So here's where we want to assess for language and memory. Um, we assess for motor skills um, and other areas of cognitive functioning that we think are going to be most sensitive to these changes in the brain that, again, we can identify these really early screeners for. So let me show you a, a couple of screeners that we are using now, and we can show a little bit of evidence for some ones that are showing to be promising. The first thing that I want to make sure that people are aware of, because a lot of people don't know, um, there are a lot of screening tools out there to screen for dementia that are specific to the Down syndrome population. So two common ones are the National Task um, Group Early Detection Screen for Dementia and the Dementia Screen for Down Syndrome. If anyone is interested in trying to get their hands on some of these tools, so this is a screener that you would use with a caregiver to look at what might be occurring early on, I'm more than happy to, to make these available. Um, in addition to these screening tools, we do a battery of these direct assessments. So here um, we're working one-on-one -on -one with the adult with Down syndrome to assess how they're doing in the areas of memory, visual memory, um, learning, attention, processing, speed, executive functioning, visual spatial constructions, their ability to manipulate objects to form different designs, as well as language. So one example, this is an example of acute recall test. So here we would show the adult with Down syndrome several different pictures. We would then take them away and we would ask them what they remember. So who can name some objects? Can anybody remember all eight images? 
It's a tough task. We give a couple of different trials for this one. And then they also have to try to retain that information over a period of about 10 minutes. And we see how many pictures they can also recall after the 10 minute um, delay. Here's an example of visual spatial organization where they're given um, a picture and some blocks and we see if they can form that picture using the blocks and how quickly they can do this task. Um, another series of our tests looks at executive functioning, so the ability to rem like remember and retain information and manipulate it. So for individuals um, without Down syndrome, a common way that we assess this is through, is through what's called Stroop tests. So here you can see this at the bottom. What you would have to do is you'd have to um, read the word while ignoring the color of the ink, right? So it's a tough task because the word blue is written in green ink. The word red is written in purple ink. And then we reverse what you have to do. So then we'd say, now we want you to do it again. This time, tell me the color of the ink and not the word. And we see how many mistakes you make and how fast you can do this task. For adults with Down syndrome, we do sort of a modified version of this. So here, we would ask them to um, first go through and name the animal. So dog, cat, dog, cat, cat, dog, dog. And then we say, do it again, but now call the cats dog and the dog cats, right? So who wants, anyone want to do this with me here? Shout it out. Dog, So then we would time and see how, how quickly they can do that task. Um, now the big thing we're looking for in our, in our study and thing that I do want to sort of make sure I highlight, that when we are going to assess for dementia and change, the best way we can do this is looking at a within-person sort of change over time. So there's a strong need for baseline measures because we see so much variability in the initial functioning of adults with Down syndrome. So it's really important that we're, we're sort of looking at um, change over time is our big marker as opposed to sort of any indicator of, of how well they're doing on a task at any single point in time. So here um, is one of the measures that's showing to be fairly promising in our early findings. Um, this is from that free and queued recall task, that first task I showed you where you had the eight pictures and you had to remember the different pictures and then remember again 10 minutes later. So here, this is from um, people in our study who participated in the first two cycles of data collection. This is about three years apart from cycle one to cycle two. Here you can see um, basically the higher the score, this means the more they could remember on that queued recall task. So the higher the score, the better. And now what we've done, these are all individuals who do not have Alzheimer's disease at this point. So we would consider them all to be sort of like, you know, cognitively they're doing well. They're, they're where we think they should be. Caregivers are not worried about Alzheimer's at this point. But these individuals, because we, again, we know that brain changes happen years to decade before we see the declines, these are individuals who are already showing brain changes um, that suggest that maybe they're on a pathway. So if you think about, in red here, we have individuals who um, started off as PIB negative. So again, PIB means, PIB negative would just mean that they have very low levels of amyloid beta in their brain at the first time point, and they continue to have low levels at the, at the second time point three years later. What you can see is these individuals have a very flat line. This is what we want. They're doing really well in the task, and they're not really showing declines over time, which is great. Now, the individuals in blue, these are individuals who started the study with, with elevated levels of amyloid beta, and they continue to have elevated levels and even higher levels three years later. And for the most part, we can see is that many of it, these individuals are showing that decline. So even before dementia symptoms would be noted, this Q retail task might be able to pick up on really subtle changes that this individual is somebody who may be at risk for transitioning into um, dementia. And maybe that would be someone we want to intervene on or at least make sure we're really following up on. Now, of course, with all great data, right, we have our one outlier here to muck up my pretty, my pretty graph. But for the most part, you see that, that decline, right? Um, in green, these are individuals who transition from having low amyloid beta to having high amyloid beta across the three years. They show a little bit of a mixed pattern. For the most part, they still seem to be doing okay, although we do have this one individual who's starting to show declines. Um, so what we think we can use this for, again, is we're really trying to understand these really early indicators we can use. They're going to link up to biomarkers of what's happening in the brain so we can best understand who we might want to intervene on. Um, but for those of you who are interested in sort of how to assess and, and, and track dementia and Down syndrome, 
again, we really, what, what our biggest suggestions are right now is that you begin these baseline assessments really by the age of 35 years. Um, again, we see a lot of these brain changes happening in, in, in virtually most of the people we see by in their 40s. So we really want to get a good baseline period prior to that. And then we can track change over time. And we think that's our best way to pick up on, on um, individuals who may be at risk to transitioning into Alzheimer's disease. For this group, it's also important to consider medical conditions because these are things that are going to influence um, cognitive functioning. Also, to really make sure that we're paying attention to what's happening in the life, right? This is times that individuals may having, be having transfer of care from, a, from parents to a sibling, um, work changes, care changes in staff. So those are also things that we want to make sure we're closely paying attention to. Finally, I just thought I would kind of build a little bit on Kayla's talk and talk about um, how some communication tips or things for um, if you are working with or you have loved ones who may be transitioning into dementia. Um, most of these are actually lessons that we have learned from the families in our study, the subset of families who do have individuals who are now beginning to show si um, signs of dementia. And they really communicate to us that, you know, when they're in sort of those later stages, um, it's not so much about Down syndrome anymore, and it really is about the dementia. Um, and they're finding that that sort of is the thing they're dealing with. So some of these tips, um, body language is so important. Um, so research on the, the um, general population, when you think about dementia and change, we know that um, about 90% of the information they're getting is more from body language and nonverbal cues than it is from what you're saying. And so the extent to which um, your, your mood's gonna influence their mood. So the extent to which you can be calm and reassuring and relaxed can play a big role in communicating that to the adult with Down syndrome who may be experiencing these symptoms. Um, in terms of other positive nonverbal communication, you convey a lot through touch, right? So touching their shoulder, holding their hand, giving hugs, these are great ways to communicate that love and that care um, that really tend to work fairly well with individuals who are experiencing symptoms of dementia. Um, also using demonstrations. So instead of just you know, verbally communicating your instructions, making sure you're relying on a really rich demonstration of what you, um, you, you want to convey to that adult with Down syndrome. Making sure you're gaining attention, um, really sitting in front of them, getting at their level, um, using a nice clear voice. Um, simple and clear instructions, you know, this is something that um, this group may um, struggle with, I think, throughout life, but particularly now you think about someone who, who's experiencing um, difficulties with memory and cognitive functioning and decision-making skills. These become even more important at, this, at these stages. Um, you know, really making sure um, to avoid open-ended questions and simplifying things. And um, for many adults, as you get into the later stages of dementia, um, you have to remember that one of the sort of hallmark features of dementia is the difficulty remembering new information. So the extent to which you know, you're asking about what may have happened earlier in the, the day may be really frustrating if it's hard um, to draw and to remember that information. And so um, if that is causing agitation, to make sure you're sort of avoiding that kind of thing because that's going to be much harder. Um, and then distraction and redirection goes a long way. Um, you know, if, if, things are being if, if things are becoming frustrated or agitation is occurring, you know, take a walk, redirect, you know, try to sort of alter that mood um, and try again later um, as being really important strategies. So finally, I'll just end. Um, this research is done by, um, you know, a host of different people. People in red are the people here at the Wasteman Center who work on this project. So Brad Christian is, is the principal investigator, and um, Renee Maku, um, where's her name on this list, is our project manager, there she is. Um, and then there's a host of, of students and um, people who help with the brain imaging and running the, the, the cognitive um, tests here. Um, we are especially grateful for the families who are in our study who give so much and allow the, us to, to track them and to be able to learn from them across time. And this study is not easy, it involves a lot of time and so they have been wonderful and so generous um, to help us understand this really important um, disease and how we can use that information to improve um, practice in our way of screening in the future. And then of course, all of our um, funders who make this, types of, this type of research possible. So I will, um, and here is the, the team here at the Wasteman Center. Um, and I will end there and 
invite discussion um, and questions and feedback from the audience. Yes, sir. you have a question? Just raise your hand. My question is um, if you noticed any uh, connection between other family members with dementia or any of those other comorbid conditions um, and the presence of increased plaques. That's a great question. So yeah, we collect a lot of data on family history um, of Alzheimer's. So we, we do collect it on, on and who else in the family has it. We also do look at genes, so there's certain genetic markers that have been linked to increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. This is not just in Down syndrome, this is for all of us. So APOE, there's different variants. Um, so certain, you know, some research early on suggested that the variant 2 might be a protective factor and variant 4 might be a risk factor. So we are looking at that. Um, that data is sort of emerging for our group and we're trying to understand how much that genetic variant might add added risk. But at that point, we still, you know, we, we are just beginning to look at that data. But absolutely, um, you know, just as in the general population, we still see a, gr a great deal of variability in this group. And so I think um, it's, the, the story is going to be about this increased production of amyloid beta, which is going to be an increased risk, but there's still a lot of room for us to understand how genetic markers um, may play into that variability. One thing that I'm personally very interested in is looking at lifestyle factors, so things like sleep, physical activity, cognitive stimulation. What are they doing? Uh, you know, these adults who are working and engaged in a lot of speech language therapy and interaction socially, or these adults who are more isolated, and does that matter in terms of the progression? So absolutely, I, think, um, I do think there's going to be a role for genetics in terms of understanding variability in this. Are you doing any looking at long vita curcumin and how that can possibly help the decrease the um, development of amyloid plaques? So what was the first part of your question? Uh, the, looking, are you looking at long vita curcumin at all? No, we are not. Um, but that's something for us to consider to look at. Yeah. No, at this point we are not. That's not what we're going to be focusing. Back here. Um, I have two questions. One's about my brother, and then the other is about my dad. The question I have about my brother is, could it be due to his le learning disability? Or since my grandma and my dad have Alzheimer's, sometimes he'll like start talking to us, and then he'll, if he doesn't get to talk right away, he'll forget what he's trying to say. And how much of Will he end up actually getting it, considering that both my grandma and dad, what's his chances of actually getting it? So good question. So, um, so what, what I described what we call episodic memory, the, the struggles to remember new information. So some of the common examples are forgetting what you're going to say, um, going to the grocery store and remembering that you're supposed to buy um, three items and for the life of you cannot remember those three items or you get out of the grocery store and you cannot remember where you parked your car. So examples like that are sort of, um, we think not just in the Down syndrome population, which we're finding as being early subtle changes, but it, for everybody. So kind of what, um, what you're describing. But the caveat, and I would say this is a big caveat, is that we see normal aging declines in episodic memory. So the extent to which um, all of us are going to experience some declines in that ability happen for everybody and it's not linked to Alzheimer's disease. So, so when you see that really, really more severe or progressing at a faster rate, that's when you'd want to sort of start screen, screening for a sort of dementia. Um, so there absolutely is, there is an increased risk. Um, there is a gen, if you have relatives, there is an increased risk. Um, it, it does vary in terms of what type of dementia you're talking about. So again, Alzheimer's disease is just one type of dementia that's related to those memory declines. There can be vascular dementia and other types of dementia. So the extent to which genetic risk is going to play a role depends on the type of dementia. So I think if it's a concern, I think those are discussions to start you know, talking with um, um, the care provider or the physician about and saying, hey, we've been noticing some changes. We, you know, and that would be when you'd start to want, want to look into it. 
Um, in terms of intellectual disability, we see this really unique increased risk in early onset with Down syndrome. And again, we think it's because of that, that chromosome 21, that you have three copies. But if you look broadly for individuals who have intellectual disability related to um, diverse etiologies or unknown etiology, meaning we don't have a genetic marker, we don't know why they have, you know, have intellectual disability, they do have an increased risk of dementia. Not all of it will be Alzheimer's type dementia. Some of them, again, would have like an increased risk for vascular dementia or Lewy body um, dementia or these other types of dementia. But as a group, we do a see a slight increased risk for dementia for individuals with, uh, with intellectual disability that's non-Down syndrome as well. Um, so again, these, these are on average. There's so many differences. So we say you have to take, take um, when you look at group level data, it's, it's sort of, it can help us understand increased risk, but it's never going to inform whether, you know, like your brother, for instance, is, would, would go on to develop this or not. There'd be so many other factors. And then the question I had about my dad is, um, you know, when you said like touch and stuff, like if I try to help my dad button up his coat and stuff, or my mom will say, oh, can you help your dad? Yeah. He'll be like, I'm not a baby. I can do this by myself. What can I say to him to ease his mind and help him out? Yeah, you know, um, so absolutely. And so, you know, a lot of times people will say it's, um, if you have someone, you know, who's experiencing dementia, you know, it's often, um, their, the thinking process is different. So it's often not wor you know, worth it to sort of argue or try to logic through an issue. Um, you know, in a lot of the later, later stages, I heard this great talk, and they were talking about how someone with dementia, um, how can you get them to change their clothes, for, it, for example. And to remember that for that individual, all they know is what they can immediately see, touch, um, and feel. And so instead of trying to logic that you've worn this out for, 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 for the past three days, we need to take it off, they may not work. Instead, you know, they said, you know, you go up and you have a little bit of peanut butter on your fingers and you say, oh no, and you put it on their, their pant leg and say, oh no, look, you're, you know, you've got something on your, your pants, we should quick go wash that. And that might be a better way. And so there's lots of wonderful books. I'm also happy to sort of give you some resources that talk through, I think, that very same thing of just um, how, can you, how can you sort of foster this with somebody who, who may be experiencing dementia symptoms in a way that can remain positive, um, but can get things you know, done, but in a way that's sort of you know, really respectful, and, and, um, but can focus on the fact that you know, at that point, it's, it's what they can see, touch, and feel in their immediate surrounding that's going to be driving their behavior. Um, a great question. Thank you, Segan. Yeah. We're going to take a, let's give her a round of applause. That was a great presentation. <laughs> We're going to take a, about a 10 minute break and then ask that you rejoin us again for Sharon Gartland at about 1030. Um, just a reminder, the refreshments in the resource fair are right around the corner and the bathrooms are right behind the auditorium.
so we are going to resume for the second half of our program this morning. Um, I'm really excited that Sharon Gartland is going to join us to give a presentation. And then after Sharon is done, we'll take a brief break and we'll set up for our clinician panel. Our clinician panel will be opportunity to ask uh, any questions from the clinicians that you see listed in your program. And then following the clinician panel is what I find to be one of the most meaningful parts of this entire day. And that's the opportunity to get to hear from our community panel. Um, and that's uh, parents and um, self-advocates. And so that'll uh, happen directly following the clinician panel. So with that, let's please welcome Sharon. Hi, it's fun to see some familiar faces out there. So thanks for coming. I'm uh, Sharon Gartland. I am an occupational therapist here at the Weissman Center and um, staff the Down Syndrome Clinic as well as the Feeding Clinic and have, I hate to say, 32, almost 33 years of experience as an occupational therapist in pediatrics. So um, thanks for giving me the chance to speak with you today. I decided when I was thinking about what to focus on um, around feeding, it's really tempting to put our lens on kind of the, the problems that we know exist, the, the kind of medical issues around feeding and kind of the impairments. But as an occupational therapist, we're, our main focus, our, our main goal is enhancing people's life, our, our national um, uh, motto is living life to the fullest. So our our mandate is to support engagement in human occupation and feeding and meal time is one of the most important uh, human occupations. And I um, so I want to start with thinking about the big picture of participation and not just kind of getting into the nitty gritty of of some of the challenge areas. We'll get to a little of that, but. Um, that's why, that's why I, I framed this around participation. So um, as most of you probably know, food is so much more than just fuel, right? So we take food in um, and we'll die if we don't. So it's a pretty important thing. And it, that's also an indicator of why it matters so much to parents. You know, it's kind of the first thing we're supposed to do for our child is successfully feed them and keep them alive. But I also want us to step back and think a little bit about what else it does for us. Eating and the experience of feeding um, is where we learn a lot of physical skills. It's where we have sensory experience. I picked this picture because it's just a beautiful <laughs> picture of that person's not just trying to get food in, they're having a good time <laughs> with, with the food. It's a social act, it's a, an emotional, interaction with other human beings, it's a cultural experience, it's just loaded with stuff. So there's a reason why this is something um, that comes up a lot in therapy and it's an area of concern for a lot of folks. Um, it's certainly one of the first ways we learn to trust the world, learn to know that people are safe, um, that we'll get what we need, that we'll be loved. Um, but it's also, as we progress, where we learn to exert our own independence, um, our opinions, in my house, everyone gets to have one food that they just for no reason refuse to eat. They don't have to have a justification for it. But then after that, that's not true. <laughs> you have to eat what I put on the, plate, on the table. Um, so just a quote from Michael Pollan, who's an author that speaks a lot about food and meals. The shared meal elevates eating from a mechanical process of fueling the body to a ritual of family and community, from the mere animal biology to an act of culture. And that's what I would want to start with saying, make sure you're not just thinking about this as the biological, mechanical process of taking in food, but remembering that this is an act of culture. It's an act of communal life that is shared across cultures. Um, and one of the things that I have found to be really helpful in some of my um, interacting with families and thinking about therapy is the difference between a family meal and a therapy meal. And if I moved in with you and every time you out ate, I nagged you about how you were doing it, <laughs> you would hate me <laughs> after a while. Um, so I think it's important for us as caregivers or therapists even to think you have permission to just have a meal 
to do whatever it takes to be together as a family, be together as people who like each other, and get in the nutrition you need. And think of that as your family meal. And there may be other times that you decide this is a therapy meal where we're going to work on skill building. But I find that really helpful. I see a lot of guilt in families that they're not working on skills. We got, I know there's more things we could do, more things we can do. So just want to offer you that that is actually a credit K to me um, from her training. She's um, someone that's done a lot of work in feeding. So family meal versus therapy meal. And you can think to yourself, we're having a family meal right now. And we're focused more on being together, getting our food in, enjoying each other. Um, also, as I've kind of been uh, suggesting, food is deeply symbolic and it's connected to our memories and emotions. Um, another favorite quote from Julia Child, a party without cake is just a meeting. And um, which I think is a kind of awesome quote. And my colleague Jean Marie knows this. Pretty much every week we have a party in clinic because food shows up. We come up with some reason, someone's leaving, someone has a birthday. But what changes it from being a meeting around a table is because there's food. <laughs> and usually festive food. So I would challenge any of you, have you ever, uh, when you think about the last celebration or gathering with others, um, can anyone think of a time that it didn't involve food? It almost always does. I mean, there are occasionally situations, but somewhere food gets connected in. And in many cases, it's the highlight of the whole event. Um, so not losing sight of participating at that level. And I, and I wanted to use the example of cake as we don't have to actually take in the cake. We don't have to eat the cake to participate, right? So the presence of the cake is symbolic of this is a celebration. And to help individuals with Down syndrome or anything else going on, allergy differences, um, difficulties eating orally, you can still be a part of that celebration just by being there and seeing the cake, visually appreciating it. This one happens to be a really beautiful one. The more elaborate and gorgeous it is, the more it may feel like a celebration. But other ways we could think about an individual being a part of a celebration, even if they couldn't really fully eat um, orally, which is often what we think is the end all of, of participation in eating, they might help make it. They might select it from the bakery. They might go with you to bring it in. Um, they might, as we do for a lot of one-year-olds and little kids, they might just smush it with their hands and smear it on you <laughs> and on their clothing. They might have a sensory experience with it. But just to broaden our, our idea of what participation is, So just to unpack that, the, the participation phrase, if uh, those of us in the therapy world kind of know this has been popping up, it's, it's a popular one right now. Um, and it comes from, if you look in the literature in, in 2001, it, all of a sudden that word participation <laughs> showed up all over the place. And it comes from the World Health Organization having um, retooled how they define disability. And we used to think of disability as a medical thing, like you either had it or you didn't. And suddenly there was some challenge being put to that saying, well, that's a little frustrating because what about how society interacts with individuals with disability? What about the environment? Just, not just the inherent challenges that might reside in a person's body, but what, what might be going on that's making them more disabled because of how we have our environment set up? And so participation became a focus of People are not disabled if they're able to participate satisfactorily in what they care about and what they want to do. So that, I use that phrase very intentionally. And so taking part and participating in a meal might look like oral intake, which a lot of us think of, self-feeding, um, joining the family at the table. So just because someone isn't eating doesn't mean they shouldn't be at the table. Um, or other mealtime contexts at, in the, uh, you know, having a kid join the, his peers at lunchtime, um, being a part of outings and celebrations that involve food, and then planning and shopping and prepping for meals. So uh, thinking about the whole spectrum of what's possible um, around participating in mealtimes is important. That said, we OTs are big on self-feeding. That happens to be one of the areas we do a lot of consulting on and a lot of interacting with families about. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that progression, and we'll get to some uh, details in a sec. But um, 
when you think about the self-feeding progression, that's also participation. And and I, I love the idea. I, I As an OT, I want involvement. I want engagement. I don't want passivity. And passivity um, goes really well with Kayla's uh, focus on communication. It's like, so them choosing what to eat is involvement. So anything, anytime you've got someone who's just sort of passively receiving whatever it is you gave them, as an OT, it's like, what's the next level? How can we get them engaged and involved in having an opinion or participating in some way? So with babies, the first self-feeding progression is might look like just turning their head, opening their mouth. Eventually, we I ask about are they starting to try to hold the bottle themselves, and um, that that's are they beginning to explore food? Are they beginning to show you they have an opinion, a face made when they're given a taste of something? Um, that moves on to a little bit older, and I and I um, I've given this kind of broad parameters because with Down syndrome, there's a big spectrum of how we progress through these milestones. So it's not so much exactly when they do it, but thinking about moving them along um, the trajectory. So next, we want to start seeing them use their, um, well, I'm sorry, I went, so the little little ones, it's all about the fingers. I, I moved past that. So holding the bottle and then finger feeding. So um, reaching out, how they get the food, letting it be messy, letting them pick it up, shove it in their mouth, um, setting them up with different sizes of objects to try. Then we move on to, to the utensils, the spoon, the fork, the cup, the straw, um, learning to manage more textures of foods. Finally, as they get a little bit older, we risk letting them have a knife, which is always a little scary. Um, but to spread, to cut, um, to open their own packaging, um, pouring from a pitcher. Young teens on up, we start to involve them more in prep, and you could do that sooner if they're ready, but meal prep, like peeling and chopping vegetables, um, making their own lunch, serving others, you know, serving the dishes into the portions on the table, setting the table, what we call cold meal prep, where we're not using fire, <laughs> um, microwave use, and then finally as an adult, we're looking for can they plan what they want to eat? Can they you know, think about nutrition? Can they shop for it? Can they prepare that meal? Can they invite others to come be a part of that meal? And I, the other progression I wanted us to think about is just social progression. So even if they're not orally able to participate in the food, what we also expect kind of a progression of um, social participation in mealtime. And that starts again, infants, they just like being with you, right? So putting them up at the table when you're eating, letting them socialize, see you enjoy food, see you interact as you're eating. Um, toddlers and preschoolers, they're at the table as well. They're beginning to express choice. They're maybe not so great at the mess part or the rule following part, right? So that they're still learning how to socially interact at the table and also attention span. They may not stay very long. Um, school age, they're going to begin. I think of preschool as sort of socializing <laughs> the young the young people so that they begin to get the routines of life. So by the time they're school age, they anticipate routines, they help to set the table, they help to prep the food. Again, it kind of crosses over with self-help. Um, they definitely get the social rules. Um, so things like using a, um, a fork, often if you think about it, is a social rule. It's We're expecting someone to use a fork rather than their fingers. So they start to get on board with that. I'll tell you a story. I, I have three sons, and they like to eat um, in, in a way that they call a meat sickle because it's just faster. So they just spear a hunk of meat and eat around it. And I think, you know, so the social rule is not cool. You can't do that. Um, but that's, you know, at home maybe, all right, we'll let you do meat sickle, but promise me that when you're in public with other people, you won't make me look bad. So that's part of, part of the social progression. Um, and then teens and young adults kind of knowing they should help. Get up and help clear the table. Take your cup to the sink. Um, whatever the rules are, setting the table, planning, participating in that socially, asking people, do you want more, passing the plates around. Um, so 
I would challenge you if you're especially at home with an individual with Down syndrome, but those of us that work with them as well, so how do we keep moving along those progressions? What's the next challenge, the next way that they might participate more and be a part of the whole process? Um, whenever we think about why it's not going well, <laughs> um, it's usually because um, we, we look at two, two things. There's the person and there's the environment. And at the person level, there's all the things that we know are kind of inherent to Down syndrome. And I've just listed a few of those. Low tone, there are some anatomical differences, small, smaller oral cavity, larger, thicker tongue, poor coordination, some postural instability. Those are all factors that can make it hard um, to succeed in eating. I wanted to briefly speak to something that I know impacts a lot of folks, which is something called dysphagia, which is a swallow disorder. This is a really common and persistent problem in children with Down syndrome. It's um, something that we have to be vigilant about that often right away impacts how well that child is thriving. And um, the, the reason it's a concern is that someone who doesn't swallow safely is at risk for then breathing in that fluid. It's called aspiration. Um, that doesn't always show itself, obviously. They're not necessarily coughing and choking. There's something called silent aspiration, which most of you may be familiar with, but that can only really be diagnosed via a swallow study. So just a side note on that, um, some of the ways that we as therapists and, and other um, caregivers manage when there is a dysphagia or swallowing problem is um, thickening the liquid, the most effective way to safely manage um, swallow problems is through a certain recommended level of thickness to the liquids. Um, also of just staying away from the unsafe foods, which is often the real thin liquids, um, or choking hazard foods, um, proper positioning during feeding, so a chin tuck. Um, and I brought a few props here, so we love straws, we love it when they master straws because that encourages a chin tuck right away to drink from a straw instead of this. So that anatomically um, creates a safer position for swallowing. And then some of you may know this already, but often for a time a child is gonna need to be tube fed, uh, either a tube in their stomach or in G tube because they're not safe to take in um, food through their mouth. So I also wanted to point out then besides the, the things that are going on that reside in the person, the environment is a huge factor and that's actually what most of us have more control over fixing. <laughs> So um, environmental factors are things like um, parents lacking strategies to manage difficult behaviors. You just might not know what to do. And teachers also, anyone that's interacting around mealtime. It may be a really distracting or overwhelming environment um, for mealtimes. Um, I, I used the example of a school cafeteria. If any of you have tried to eat recently at a school cafeteria, <laughs> I don't know how anyone does it actually. It's really loud and very distracting. Um, the family itself might not have good eating habits, so that's huge to support regular meal times, regular snack times, not letting access to graze whenever you want. Um, and then lack of opportunity. A lot of um, that system of children sort of saying, no, I want to do that myself, let me use the fork, let me use the knife maybe isn't happening. They're not getting that same feedback and parents need to be helped to think about, oh, I could let this this child carry their own plate to the sink now. So that's, I, I think of that as a lot of my job sometimes in clinic is just to say, hey, let's think about the next thing they could be doing to move towards more participation. So setting the stage for success, these are just good mealtime practices. Um, having regular family meal times, limiting technology while eating, modeling good food choices and enjoyment of food. So the more they see you liking foods, the more they're apt to want to eat it. Involving children in, in rituals. Rituals are very soothing around mealtime. Um, you know, setting the table, clearing the table, all the things that go along with it are going to help someone participate in that and cooperate with that. Providing choice, um, avoiding power struggles is really key. Good supportive seating, um, and then repeated exposure to new foods. So pickiness often comes because they just haven't gotten that repeated exposure to a variety of foods. Also matching skill with challenge. Um, we have to look at what are they able to do and handle and picking foods and situations that they can succeed at. So that's something that um, as an OT we're trained to do very well. 
Um, so just a few ideas to end with, so I don't leave you with uh, nothing to, to go away with. Uh, to talk about self-feeding and some ways that you can intervene there or, or provide support and matching skill to challenge. With finger feeding, think about giving them a cracker to hold and chew on. Um, those puffs, we love those puffs because they're sticky and they have a lot of success and they have to figure out how to pick them up and put them in their mouth and that eventually works on some really nice precision grasp. Um, you can also hold the puff and force the, the younger child to have to use a more precise grasp instead of that whole hand kind of caveman in the mouth. Um, spoon use, picking the right kind of spoon. I think I brought one. Yeah, so um, I liken it to if I handed you a serving spoon. <laughs> um, if I said, here, here's this big giant serving spoon, feed yourself, how awkward would that be? So handing a kid a regular sized spoon that's long is hard for them. So you use different spoons for self-feeding versus um, the parent feeding them. So we love this kind of a spoon, the maroon spoon, because it's got this nice shallow bowl that works, helps a child um, clear the bowl of the spoon. But we like this kind of a spoon for a child we're working on self-feeding because they don't have to work so hard on the bending. They, it's already kind of taken care of that. It's got a little built-up handle for easier grasp. So thinking about what's working. Um, the other idea see here, is also a plate. This has doesn't slip around and it's got a built-up side. So you can walk down any target aisle and find things that, that will provide this kind. You don't have to buy the expensive therapy version. Um, Fork use, same thing, using a short fat fork, <laughs> short fat fork, that's hard to say. Um, Preloading the tines, so loading up the fork and then laying it down so that they get used to picking it up. Um, and then offering them things that are easy to spear so there's quick success. And then finally with drinking, um, we love the cup with handles as OTs because that's a good place to start and it's a little easier than this kind of grasp. We also love this kind of where there's a rim, but it still controls the flow. So looking for that kind of a cup is helpful. Um, working on the skill of resting the cup on the lip, not on the teeth. And then I didn't bring an example, but there is something called a, um, a straw trainer that's usually shaped like a honey bear. And that is a way to help encourage kids um, to, to learn how to drink from a straw because you can squeeze the liquid up and help them access it. So there's lots of tricks to move towards more successful participation in eating. Um, I wanted to wrap up by just saying, tap your professionals. And, and eating and feeding is something that's very multidisciplinary. You might want help from someone with behavioral training skills, speech and language, OT, physician. There's medical factors that impact it. So, we, one of the things we do is have an interdisciplinary team here on our feeding team or in our Down syndrome clinic, and we might put our heads together about what's needed for any particular situation. Um, and finally, I've given you a few ideas for helpful resources that should be available online. And I will end with letting folks ask questions. I think there's a couple minutes for questions. Anyone? Do you have any insight into helping children choose appropriate portion sizes? One of my sons with Down syndrome likes all food and will eat a variety of things. And if it's something he likes, he will eat until it's gone. Doesn't matter how many bowls that is. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I think there's a lot of strategies for that, but probably the best strategy is not to have it family style. If, you know, is, is just to you, you say at the divided plate where there's this much portion and they have to then return and, and control that. But if you're working on, which I applaud, if you are, to their, them learning to manage their own selves, I see you nodding, which is great. And that, that's the next thing. So you've probably been controlling portion size. So that's where I would literally use perhaps a scooper, <laughs> you know, break it down and say, what, you get one cup more <laughs> and it goes in this bowl. Um, and I, I don't know if you're talking about meal, um, like on the plate or at snack time. Um, Any time at snack time, literally. We've got a fruit bowl out because we have many other children. And uh -huh. it's out for them anytime, but he will literally eat six bananas or 
Yeah. You know, six cups of yogurt the other day when my older son was babysitting and had left the room. <laughs> yes. So, and I think that that may be, you know, that that's probably a longer conversation, but it, it's, um, you may have to limit access and you might want to post, you know, if, if there's a way to have a picture <laughs> next to the fruit bowl, um, you know, one banana in a hand or something like that, um, re, you know, that some of these strategies of saying, remember, you know, one scoop and it has to always go in a bowl. The more there are rules about it, it's like you may pick one piece of fruit. It has to be eaten at the table or you can have one scoop of the snack mix and it has to go in the bowl. Um, but making it very concrete and clear. Um, and, you know, when you're transitioning from you as the parent managing all of that to them having the responsibility of it, that probably is going to require a whole interim stretch where you're still monitoring. But thinking about how do I pull back, say, remember what the rule is, and maybe have them remind you, oh, one banana. <laughs> um, Yeah, and that again, a longer conversation. But I think I, I think it's a it, there can be a lot of factors playing into why that's challenging. It also may be that they don't have a lot of well, a lot of self control or a lot of body you know input or awareness of how how full or not full they are. So um, anyway, <laughs> sure. And as always, I invite my colleague Mary Locast to weigh in on ideas as these questions come up today. Other ideas or questions? Yes. Um, so I have a three-year-old um, daughter with Down syndrome, and she drinks from like that blue cup that you have. Um, but I always wonder about like when I should try to start her on a regular cup, like a small cup. Um, I sort of try to say that you have to be careful because the, they could aspirate or whatever if she takes too much in. Or um, is there any? Should I just? Would you recommend I go ahead and? Just try that out, or, or could that be dangerous in some way? So what's nice about if they're used to this cup is then they've gained some of the skills for um, drinking from a rimmed cup, an open cup, which is where we want to head. This is um, a, a, a therapy cup that we love. It's not a cup that you necessarily just say, here, drink, have a drink. But as a parent, um, this is it's called a nosy cup, and it, it squishes so you can control the flow. A little bit and then you can also see how much is going in so that's a nice interim from if you want to move from this to sometimes having her drink out of an open cup you could also try those little medicine cups are nice they're just a small little rim small amount and you want to be vigilant if there's coughing or choking that goes on but if you don't have reason that to be concerned usually what they'll do is just seem a little overwhelmed with the volume that's coming in and hopefully they've got some of that protective cough letting you know too much I can't handle it so even though it might be upsetting to you that they cough or spit it back out that actually tells me oh there she knew she couldn't handle that much so those little medicine cups or this are a good way to start with that process but I think it's you know, I would go ahead and give some opportunities to try it um, if you've had a lot of success already with this. Or you could move on to a sippy that has less um, flow control is another way to do it. Um, just to see, is she beginning to manage a higher volume of, of liquid coming in? But if, if there's any concern or more complex problems, then I would say, you know, bring someone in to, to help you with that. But if this is more just, I'm just wanting some... Well, I mean, if there's regular coughing, it tells us that she's not handling it very well. And that probably, if that, if you, she never is drinking without there being kind of a big eyed, I'm coughing and can't cope, that probably says, you're not, you're not really ready for this and we need to lessen the flow. You could also start with thicker liquids. Um, so a milkshake or a puree or a, a smoothie, because that just is, gives her time to manage it in her mouth. So those are some ideas. Mary, yes. Um, there's a cup called the Reflow, R-E-F-L-O-W, and it's uh, I think Beyond Play has it in their catalog. It's a little bit of a larger cup. I was kind of hoping for a little smaller Reflow size cup. It has a <laughs> insert that you put in the cup that's a little less than an open cup, but mm -hmm. a little I've used with 
us with like one to two inches of liquid in the bottom. That's it. And then it isn't the whole cup full falling. <laughs> right. So right. That, that one I've had a lot of luck with. Reflow. Um, I believe it's at beyondclay.com. Nice. Is, uh, this is what OTs do for fun as we cruise websites. Yeah. Straw's great too. I love straws. <laughs> Mary's giving it the thumbs up. So Mary Lowcast is an OT here um, as well and is highly qualified to speak to this topic as well. Do we need to wrap up? Well, we're going to transition to the clinician panel and Sharon's going to be on that panel. So actually, if, um, if someone has a question for Sharon, Sharon, why don't you take it, and then we'll construct while the you panel set up. while you set up. Yep. Okay. Great. And thanks, Mary, for adding in. Would you like to ask? Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. My question is regarding her question about the overeating. Uh-huh. I have a child with another type of disability. Oh. Um, in the feeding clinic, do you guys have um, any type of therapy for that kind of uh, behavior? So a, a child who's overeating? Yeah, because, I mean, being, having a disability, an intellectual disability is very hard for him to yeah, understand. Yeah, and that's a really common problem. And it's one, you know, I kind of, as I was preparing this, I'm like, so what do we cover in 20 minutes? And I know that's a big one. I would personally start with um, getting an appointment with a dietitian okay. and getting a real clear sense of what portion is appropriate. For your child so that you as a parent know exactly what you're aiming for and then I think there's a the, I, the feeding clinic hasn't done a lot of that but it is potentially something we could contribute to but also down syndrome clinic is a place that we could speak to that but I think um, unpacking what why is this hard what's going on um, I, I'm a huge fan of starting with so what do we know about where this person is at you know in terms of how much uh, what's their BMI, how much are they taking in, and what should they be taking in. And then, and then working with um, some folks to help you know what's it going to take to help limit access to or portion control. But it's a big question. It's, a, it's probably very much worthy of its own presentation, perhaps next year. Thank you so much. <laughs> sure. So at this time, I'm going to invite our other clinicians um, to come forward. Uh, we're gonna, Kayla's gonna come back up, Maria Stanley, and then Max Wilson, too, is a, a genetic counselor who's gonna join our clinician panel. And Jean Marie Kammer will moderate. Don't worry about the antics. Okay, my name is Jean Marie Kammer. I'm the nurse. I'm very honored to be the nurse in the Down Syndrome Clinic here at the center. And I'm, we've taken some questions uh, from the audience uh, in written form throughout the morning. And we're going to ask the ones that we've received so far in the written form. And then we can open it up to the audience for more questions. And our panel consists of Kayla, our speech and language pathologist. Dr. Sharon Gartland, our occupational therapist. Maria Stanley, our behavioral, our developmental behavioral pediatrician. And then Max, our geneticist. So the first question we have, um, it says volume of voice. Is there any smart or iPhone visual meter support for voice volume that are speech activated? Ooh. Sounds like Kila. Yeah, that is such a great question. Um, I don't have any by name, but I would encourage you to search online and um, on the App Store. Um, I remember uh, back to my training, we had some individuals who were using that for feedback. Um, and I think it would be a nice way to pair a visual with that, um, with understanding more of those abstract labels of what's a quiet voice, what's a, a louder voice. So I think that would be really cool to explore um, in tandem with your team. Okay. Next question, um, it's in regards to, it says iPad speech software talker. 
question is, what software would you recommend? What did Kayla show us? Uh, great question, um, and I um, think this would be a nice time to talk too about the Communication Aids and Systems Clinic. So that's one of the clinics here at the Wiseman Center, and if you go to the website, there's information um, if you're interested in a referral um, where your physician could put in a referral for our clinic there. Um, and I would say uh, in terms of the, the speech generating devices, it's really individualized. So the, the process um, that we go through, uh, we have the initial assessment and then we have usually an extended, uh, it can vary to um, a portion of diagnostic therapy where we're looking at feature matching to see what features of this communication software, the hardware, the symbol set, um, different features of the, the speech generating device and software like prediction for uh, grammatical markers or organization of language. Um, that would be the time where we would really tease out what's best for the individual. Um, to respond to the question about what I showed on the slides, um, that software was the chat software. Um, and if you Google that, it's from Saltillo. But yeah, I would encourage you to reach out to your speech language pathologists, your specialty clinics to learn more about what systems, just like any other strategy, could be the best fit for you. And there was another part to that question. Saying, uh, they asked, what drawbacks might there be? Uh, could a dependency on the software develop? Oh, I'm glad that you asked that question. Um, so we have some really nice research now showing that um, there isn't a negative um, impact on speech or language development with pairing a visual with speech. Um, again, just like we all use multiple strategies to communicate, um, I like to think of use of a speech generating device or low tech symbols like in a communication book as another tool that the individual can use really in tandem with their other communication strategies. Mm -hmm. Here's another one. I wonder frequently about putting both the fun and functional in high school regular education courses. Any suggestions for curriculum enrichment in courses such as biology, U.S. history, etc., that supports language social development and personal growth for students in these inclusive environments? Go Kayla. Okay. <laughs> um, well, one fun way that I've seen, I'm thinking of a, a literature class, um, but I, I'm sure that this could be adapted in um, other ways. And I don't have direct experience in the school setting, so I would encourage you to reach out to your school SLPs because they will have a wealth of information about this. Um, but one example that I like to think of um, is how you can adapt like a novel that the, everybody is studying in class and, and how you can pull out the, the main parts, the main themes of the novel, the characters, and represent them um, in a way to support the individual's understanding and expression about those topics. But ultimately, I would reach out to your school SLPs about that great question. And we don't have any more questions that were in the written form. So, Teresa, are, is there a microphone to take questions from the audience? Uh, the, there aren't microphones in there, but um, you could just uh, repeat back. Um, sure. Yes, yeah, so keep in mind we have a geneticist, a physician, an OT, and an SLP. So any questions you may have. Oh, thank you. If you notice a continued decline in PIB, would you refer individual to an MD for possible medications to slow progression of dementia? So I think um, I, I'll take this, but I'll qualify it by saying I'm a developmental behavioral pediatrician and only because I work with colleagues who um, are in the world of um, caring for adults with Down syndrome, um, I have some qualification to answer that question. I would say, you know, whenever you're worried, I, I don't think the decline um, necessarily would be based on um, looking at PIB levels other than 
rather than seeing anything functional that's changing. Um, I'm not aware of any medication or um, strategies that would be used, or, uh, uh, medication strategies that would be used um, proactively outside of um, studies right now. Um, and But I think that if you are interested in engaging in studies, there are studies happening. Um, I always mention to people, um, clinicaltrials.gov is a good place to find um, recognized uh, clinical trials that are happening around the country. Um, if you're interested in looking for those kinds of things, I would also encourage you um, if you're not already to um, join both the, um, the research registry here at the Weisman Center and also um, the uh, DS Connect, which is a national registry uh, for Down syndrome. And um, both of those are important ways that you can find out about new studies. Um, the ones here are local. Um, the uh, DS Connect is national. Um, neither one of them carries any obligation. Um, they just are opportunities to um, be informed if there's research that you might be eligible to participate participate in. Um, but um, I did appreciate that Segan mentioned the NTG, which was one of the um, baseline um, cognitive um, measures. It's not, it, it's basically a questionnaire for caregivers, um, but it's really important. Um, and it's something that's recommended uh, routinely for uh, um, all folks with Down syndrome to use every decade. Um, I, and I can't remember what age it starts, but I thought in adulthood they just recommended using it every 10 years, possibly starting at age 30. Um, but that's pretty available, and um, and it's something that's a way of kind of tracking what's happening over time. Because I think the hard thing is a lot of times if somebody has a possible decline, we don't know what they're baseline was, we don't have any evaluation or assessment, so that saying that there's been a decline can sometimes be hard to quantify. So that was a lot of information, but, um, and hopefully answered your question. Our nine-year-old daughter with Down syndrome has sleep apnea. She removes her CPAP mask during the course of the night, every night. Any suggestions on how to help her wear her mask throughout the night? That is a really good question, um, and it's a problem that a lot of families, uh, a challenge that a lot of families face. First of all, I really applaud you for getting that evaluated and for being willing to work on using the CPAP. It really is important. Um, I think that the best information that we have now, and I expect more to come, is that it, it has a significant impact on learning, on language development, on um, attention and behavior during the day. If some Somebody has obstructive sleep apnea that's not treated, and and thinking about all the the challenges that folks already face, I think adding that to the mix makes makes life even harder. Um, CPAP is not um, <laughs> not for the faint of heart. No, it it really is. It can be a challenge. I think sometimes um, there can be some fun and functional ways to incorporate it. I, I've seen some families do really um, ex uh, fun things like. Um, pretend, uh, one guy uh, loved to pretend he was an astronaut and so they called it his astronaut mask and they made it fun that way. I think sometimes removing it during the night, it's not even that they're so conscious of doing it, it they're not being intentionally difficult or disruptive, it's just like I, I, I'm half awake and I pull this thing off my face because it feels weird. Um, I think checking in with your sleep medicine specialist makes a lot of sense because they can help to make sure, first of all, that the settings are correct because sometimes Sometimes if the settings aren't right, it can that can make a difference. Um, there are different kinds of CPAP appliances and different ones work better for different people. Um, I have had some families do just very intentional sitting at the bedside for two or three nights and it's like hell for those couple of nights because you're, you know, you pretty much have to stay there and stay awake but just keep replacing it every time and some kids just get used to it. Um, but I think if you're continuing to experience challenges, I would check back in with sleep, your sleep medicine specialist and also they work closely with health psychology who often also has strategies around helping to, um, to kids to get used to and continue wearing their CPAP. And, and, it, and it can be successful. I think that's the other thing is I think so many people don't even want to go there with a sleep study because they think, oh, I've heard CPAP, CPAP it's so hard and I, I know my child won't um, use that or participate with that. But 
I, I have seen some amazing examples of the change it can make when, when obstructive sleep apnea is really well controlled. I've seen older kids who've gotten off of psychiatric medications because their behavior improves so much just because of using CPAP. And so I would encourage you to continue and persist and, and work with the, your team from the sleep medicine clinic. Um, your question? Mm -hmm. And um, we're the CPAP family. Everybody in our family uses CPAP. Okay. So it was much easier for our son with his CPAP and everything. Um, mm -hmm. However, the one thing that I found lacking was instructions yeah. of how to have him use it. And so my mm -hmm. training as a speech and language pathologist mm -hmm. came in handy. Mm -hmm. We use Scooby Doo using a CPAP. And he was able to wear it for five minutes. And Matthew wore it then for five minutes and everything. And instead of concentrating on the full night, we just added time to that. And pretty soon he was sleeping through the night, easily 10 hours with the CPAP in place. And he has evidence that he has removed it to blow his nose, but has replaced it also. Um, so that's a really, really good thing as a parent to see that it is working that well. But his, his pediatrician insisted that he use it for cardiac purposes, okay, also along with the other. Yeah. We see no difference in his sleep awareness during the day, um, with or without, but for the sake of the pediatrician and his doctor, we went ahead and we did it, thinking mm -hmm. about longevity. Sure. And we wanted to make sure he was well off for a long time. Oh, thank you so much for sharing your experience. That's great, because I think sometimes hearing somebody else who's found successful strategies is another way to figure it out for yourself. So thank you. And that's a good example of, I'm a big fan of, of encouraging families to go to other like parent blogs or you know get suggestions from other families, because often we run out of ideas as clinicians and um, other parents have done it and say, try this, it worked for me. So it's a great way to crowdsource. <laughs> There's some questions. I'm going to kind of start here and go around the room so everybody gets a chance. I'm, uh, I'm on the match board with Max, so I'm going to put him on the spot a little bit. <laughs> okay. uh, we're always trying to figure out, so my wife and I had a really difficult diagnosis when our daughter was born, so we're always trying to figure out ways that we can kind of get work with the genetics community and the geneticists and the hospitals to figure out what we can do, what resources we can provide to help them. So I was wondering if you guys could just talk a little bit about your experiences with uh, either delivering the diagnosis or talking to parents who've had a tough time with it and kind of strategies for that and what we could do to help. Do you want to start? Sure. Uh, Are people hearing the questions in the back? Yes? Okay, good. Okay. Um, yeah, I think something as a, a genetics provider, especially in a prenatal setting that we are always striving to do is to um, improve these conversations because they are very difficult conversations, right? Uh, in many cases, parents are coming in unbeknownst to an ultrasound, having ultrasound findings that are highly suggestive of Down syndrome or getting routine prenatal testing and being told that the likelihood that this result would find out that their child has Down syndrome is very low for most people. So it's a very surprising shock and there's a, a, a hill of information to get over that is very overwhelming. And so um, I think what has been useful and helpful for us is certainly being in touch with a provider who is familiar in having these conversations. So a genetic counselor like myself, we have specific training not only in the genetics information, um, the, the science of it, but also uh, in facilitating conversations with people, having the empathy, having the time that a lot of times providers may not have to um, actually face-to-face -face go through these things, to give resources, to discuss uh, data that we now have of families and what it's like to have a child with Down syndrome because it's um, a scary prospect for people who just don't know what that's going to be like. So I kind of meander my way through your question. I think um, one of the ways in which we can do better is events like this and to get feedback from families and how things went well, how things didn't go well, how we can improve on these conversations. I know as a board member, one of my goals is to 
increase the presence and awareness of an organization like MADS because there are a lot of families that are meeting with providers and getting diagnoses in which those providers may not know of some of the resources that already exist in the community and can provide that foundational care immediately to families and get them plugged in to meet with uh, other people as well. So I think making those connections is the most important thing, especially in that crucial, crucial period um, after that diagnosis. Um, I don't know if anyone else has You know, and I was just going to add one more thing. Um, there are, so thanks to families for helping us learn how to do a better job with this. Um, I think that, you know, over the last 15 years, there actually has been research to try to help us understand how can we do better. Um, I personally am rarely in the position of delivering a diagnosis because usually we get involved once there's been a diagnosis. But um, I think that um, what's great is that peop um, the medical community, I think, has tried to work really hard to learn more. And that there are two documents that we often refer people to. One is um, the AAP um, Health Supervision Guidelines um, for the care of, of uh, individuals with Down syndrome that does um, review briefly what are the key points for medical providers when they're delivering a new diagnosis. But there's also a really wonderful source document through the, um, what, I, and I can't remember your professional organization, but that was put out um, by the Genetic Counseling Professional Organization that really spells out in a lovely way how does a, how does a diagnosis best get delivered. But I think your continued feedback about how how we can do a better job helps us get better at what we do. Um, and, and I think a lot of times, it, it, no, um, you know, most often I think the, the health providers that are giving the diagnosis want to do a really good job. And so part of it is just continuing to educate them about these resources that are available. I think the other group that's been really involved with this, um, there's a, a website called lettercase.org and they have free downloads that help people giving a new diagnosis, that have materials that families could like immediately pull up on their phone or their iPad at the time of diagnosis that help families start to understand um, what the diagnosis means. And so I think there, you know, um, there, it, it's starting, the education is getting out there, but it, it's an ongoing education effort. I think there was a, yes, your question? recently done a swallow study and have been trying to change positioning and um, we're just kind of at our wit's end of what to do about congestion when she has, I mean it's, it's and then she spikes fevers and we've been on antibiotics and we're just looking for any other like out of the box suggestions of what else we can do. I mean we're back for our PCP next week and we're back to ENT next week and I don't know, everyone's just like, you know, it used to be wait and see and we're done waiting and seeing and so now we're, what, what else? What else, what are, what are outside the box options that we're not sure? So I, I'm not sure about outside the box, but I think part of the issue is that, um, that there really are a huge range of different reasons that that can be the case. And sometimes a lot of reasons in combination that cause that to happen. You mentioned a couple of, you know, you mentioned um, um, a swallowing problem, which can sometimes cause that congestion reflux that's going up into the nasal passages can cause irritation and that can cause chronic congestion. Just the difference in, I, we know there are craniofacial differences for folks with Down syndrome and so the anatomy can sometimes cause, you know, just that the passages are a little bit smaller, more crowded. That can be a, an additive factor. Um, it could be that, you know, adenoids are starting to grow already at that age and maybe that's a, a contributor. We know for some individuals with Down syndrome, there are immune system differences that need to be evaluated. Um, and especially somebody who's had like recurrent severe infections that required hospitalizations or very frequent antibiotics, that may be another thing to explore. Um, there is um, a newer um, clinic at the hospital called an aerodigestive clinic. And I think sometimes when we're trying to figure out like, so what's the ENT part and what's the pulmonary part and what's the feeding and swallowing part and how do we put all of those things together and figure this out once and for all and get this 
done. Um, sometimes that's a nice route. Um, it, like I said, it's a newer clinic, um, but I think that that's a, a really valuable place. Rather than trying to sort it out with different individual specialties and different people, it's a team that works together to try to get it figured out in a more efficient way. And so that may be another opportunity. Um, but as far as uh, you know, out of the box, I, I don't, I don't have that. But I think there are a lot of real medical reasons why it can be, and I think many of those are treatable. And so. It is at American Family Children's Hospital. Yep. And how? What would be the way of going through a process to be referred? To, I mean, would that just be like from a from your? your could be from your primary care doctor. Uh huh. Or you could talk to the ENT specialist because ENT is one one component of that clinic, and just see like, gosh, we've been really frustrated. We've been trying all these things. Some it just isn't getting better. Yeah. Do you think maybe that would be a helpful thing for for our child, or maybe they have another idea that hasn't been tried yet to help you? Oh, uh, so um, in, um, allergy and immunology are together, and they can do some testing to look at that. Yeah, it, it's usually blood work that they would do, um, but a lot of times it's based on the history too, and they they'll have a, an, a sense just based on the history about how um, how likely it is that that would be a problem and what they would need to pursue. So I think we have time for one more question. You were yeah patiently waiting. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> if I were to set a, a rule for one question because of the delayed speech is intense, mm -hmm. maybe he's just in a habit of, of uh, waiting. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But if I were to set one question and then set the timer, okay, we're, here's the question. You have this amount of time to answer it and to know that you can do that. Or would that just be like <laughs> too much stress? Thank you for your question. Um, I think that without knowing why the individual is really struggling with coming up with a response, whether that's um, challenges with language understanding or challenges with getting the speech sounds out or the motor programming of coordinating those sounds together or fluency where they're getting stuck or having a block. I think that sometimes adding um, a time limit, time limit can add an extra pressure, just like as we're speaking too, if I know I just have 10 seconds left to answer this question, then that's, well. Um, so I, I would suggest maybe, um, well, looking again for that assessment to see what factors are coming into play. Why, why is this change happening? And looking to your team to, um, to see is that is it just speech and language, or are there other factors like hearing, or other medical factors, or or um, things coming into play? Um, and then maybe looking at I like the idea of a specific question um, and showing the individual a really like fail-safe way to respond, like like giving a gesture or you know something where you can get that that participation and. Um, be able to um, reinforce that and say, great job responding to my question. It was so awesome how, um, you know, you heard my question and you responded to that. that. That was so great. So I think starting with the assessment and then maybe showing the in individual a way that um, uh, teaching a, a specific response or a, a way just to support that back and forth to, to build on that nice success could be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, one more question. No, it's not a question. Back to the person who asked about fun in history and yeah. science. I can't speak to what's going on in school because that's kind of their purview. But one thing that I found helpful is a company called High Noon Books, and it's highnoonbooks.com. But they specialize in making um, age appropriate content, but written at a younger reading level. So if your child is reading but not at the high school level, they still put out a lot of books that might be interesting to a high schooler as far as topics and content, but the writing is at a, they have multiple different grades.
grade level writing level. Mm -hmm. And it's really fun because kids are, you know, if, if they're reading at a second grade level or third grade level, they're still really interested in yeah. high school topics or eighth grade level topics. And that's a nice resource to kind of get at some of those topics, but at levels they can read at on their own. What is the name of that site? High, high Noon Books. High Noon Books. Yeah, Thank you, Mary. And thank you for the great questions. Now it's time for our community panel. I'm just going to ask that um, those individuals come forward and take a seat at the panel board here. While they're doing that, I want to introduce Joe Bridges. He's the president of MADS, and today would not be possible without these community partnerships. So um, I think this is our eighth year doing the Day with the Experts, and through that entire duration, it's been a, a wonderful partnership with MADS. So Joe's going to tell you a little bit more about opportunities with MADS. Thank you, Teresa. So that's very kind of Teresa to say, but really, uh, this would not be possible without our friends here at the Weissman Center, all of Teresa's hard work, all of the clinicians' hard work, uh, and their willingness to partner with us on an event like this where we can really bring the knowledge that we're so fortunate to have here in the Madison community and surrounding areas to our membership and to the general public. So I just want to say thank you to them one more time too. So a little bit about what we do at MADS. I know a lot of you know this already and I know a lot of you personally. Uh, but so the Madison Area Down Syndrome Society or MADS, we're a 501c3 nonprofit based here in Madison, but we serve the greater Madison area. So we try to serve the surrounding counties uh, and try to make sure that every individual with Down syndrome and their families in our coverage area has connections to the services they need, has the support they need, and has a space in the community here. So our mission, as I said, is to provide support to individuals with Down syndrome and their families while advancing awareness, respect, an opportunity and our vision is to create a world where individuals with Down syndrome are valued as productive self-sufficient and contributing members of the greater society so how do we do that this event is a great example of that this is one of our signature events it's a marquee event that we put on the calendar every year so much work goes into it but so much value comes out of it so we do things like this we do things like pizza parties for our families just community fellowship type events uh, you know, we host other educational seminars throughout the year. Uh, I wanted to highlight one very exciting thing that we're doing in 2018 and 2019, which is really looking to expand our coverage uh, first into the Rock County area. We're also going to look to expand further west and a little bit further north. So please keep a lookout for that. And really, I just wanted to say that we don't exist as an organization without you, without our community, because we're not, you know, we're not a brick and mortar shop. Uh, we don't really have any formal uh, programming other than what our community asks us to do. So we always want to listen. We always want to talk with you. Uh, please join the conversation, and we're happy to have you here. Thank you for coming. Good morning, everyone. Thank you again for coming. My name is Robin Valley Massey. I'm the clinic manager for the Weissman Center Clinics and the Autism Treatment Center. I also want to say thank you to our community panel today and we're going to start actually with Joe. Joe is going to introduce Emily and then we'll have each of our panel members introduce themselves. So I will uh, I'll first just again say Max Wilson who participated uh, on the clinicians panel is one of our board members so thanks to Max. Uh, Emily Elmer is also one of our board members. I'm going to let Emily speak for herself but first I just wanted to tell you uh, what a valued member of our board she is. She's an amazing self-advocate. She contributes invaluable perspective as a full member of the MADS board. Emily, you want to tell them a little bit about yourself? My name is Emily. I'm a, I'll be a MADS in 2017. And I'm self-advocate to the MADS board for public schedule together on Google. It's Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. Yep, yep. Well, that's how we get our meetings scheduled. And then you, you also, uh, you work, right? I work. I work to uh, commercial relations at Pittsburgh. 
I was taken the bus to our first school year by the summer, the coming hours in the summertime. And I think we're going to hear a little bit more about uh, what Emily does and some of her interests and other things during the panel. Thanks, Emily. Thank you, Sal. Hi, I'm Judy Heil. I'm a parent, as you already know. Um, I'm also a retired speech and language pathologist in the public schools for of um, 37 and a half years. And now I'm um, a, basically a full-time volunteer at Judy's Playhouse as a co-literacy uh, coordinator. Um, program leader, volunteer, etc., etc., etc. Let me see. Um, I think that's a good enough question. Hi, I'm Nadia Dam. Um, I'm also a parent of a daughter, three-year-old daughter with Down syndrome, Alyssa, and then I also have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. And I forgot to mention, too, I do have a two-and-a-half-year-old daughter named Kennedy who has Down syndrome. Thank you, everyone. So we're going to start with our first question, um, and this may go to um, anyone on the panel. And Joe and Nadia, you may you've had a more recent experience with this, but can you tell us um, when you first noticed a difference in your child's development, and what was the diagnostic process like for you? Okay. Uh, so our diagnostic process was not not excellent. Uh, my wife is. 35, so of course, she was 35 when she was pregnant, so of course it was a geriatric pregnancy, which never <laughs> ceases to amaze me. Uh, so we did the, the ultrasound, but we didn't do the genetic testing. We were told we had a 1 in 7,000 chance of having a, a baby with Down syndrome, so we kind of wrote it off, frankly. Uh, and then when Kennedy was born, uh, she had a belly button hernia, and the pediatrician on call came in and delivered the diagnosis by saying, uh, you know, I would want to know if there was something that was wrong with my child. Uh, the belly button hernia is okay, but she has Down syndrome. So it was not a great, not a great start, right? Uh, so that's one of the reasons we got involved with MADS and involved with the community. But uh, in terms of when we first noticed something a little bit different, I, it took me a little while, and it was really when a few weeks after Kennedy was born, we got together with another couple who had had a baby just a little bit before us. Their child was born a little bit before. And holding their son, you could tell that there was just a difference in the way he held himself up, right? He could hold his head a little bit firmer, his joints were a little bit stiffer. So that was really the first time that I noticed it. Uh, and we, you know, we worked basically from that time on to try and get her some of the care that we thought would help her develop. Um, well, I also had a geriatric pregnancy and um, we didn't do any genetic testing, but um, there was a, a echogenic focus on Alyssa's heart and that was a marker for Down syndrome so um, we ended up doing the genetic testing just because we thought in our minds we just wanted to not have people ask us about that and do more testing about it um, but the testing came back um, positive and so yeah it you know it's it's really kind of been an interesting experience of reflecting like over the past few years about what that experience was like because when I was going through it, it felt very negative, it felt very sad, it felt like people were very cautious as they interacted with us um, when the issue of termination came up a few times, that felt um, like an assault kind of um, I, th I think I was just very emotional, very sensitive when that was brought up um, it felt like a suggestion that maybe this was going to be too hard to deal with or maybe you know the way I was interpreting it back then was maybe um, uh, her life isn't as valuable um, so now that I've had time and space I realized that it actually was uh, I think pretty positive and that people were being neutral and objective and supportive um, but I think it's just helpful to keep in mind that it's just a very sensitive, um, vulnerable, emotional time. So even neutrality can kind of be misperceived um, because you don't, you don't get, you have conversations that you would never have with someone if their child did not have that diagnosis. And so, um, but I did have some, some very positive experiences too in terms of receiving information that was very helpful about 
um, statistics related to families uh, with Down syndrome and their um, positive quality of life um, and the impact on the siblings. There was just a lot of very helpful information that um, was very black and white and positive, overwhelmingly positive, and so that was just very helpful. Also, the delivery of the diagnosis, I think I remember exactly where I was in the parking lot of my work, and um, every time I walk by there, it's like I remember, I remember that conversation on the phone, and so um, again, I think it's just, it's such a, um, difficult task, I think, to deliver the news. And so, um, you know, and I've given the feedback about, I think, just really setting up and structuring a time when um, people are ready to receive the feedback. Because for me, I, I could have not answered it or I could have said now isn't a good time. But in my mind, I was just getting, getting that out of the way. She didn't have it. So um, I was not expecting that. And then, you know, uh, yeah, had to go into work and try to like be normal. I'm a psychologist, so that was particularly hard <laughs> to go in and interact with people. Um, so anyway, it was uh, it was a mixed experience. I think looking back, I, I have more clarity, but at the time, um, it felt very mixed and hard. Thank you so much for sharing those experiences. Judy, Can I you want to add something? something? Um, our experience was a little bit different because we adopted Matthew as a baby. Um, with Down syndrome and um, we were chosen by his birth parents to parent him um, and what that mom commented about she knew that something wasn't quite right and um, so she went to her doctor and found out that the child had Down syndrome she said that she was given a lot of choices this was 29 years ago um, she was given choices of, you know, terminating the pregnancy or, you know, delivering and, you know, and having the child. Um, she did not have a support, uh, supportive um, helpmate in her life. Her, um, the father, um, biological father, um, couldn't believe that he would actually, you know, have, um, that his sperm would cause could be a, an a, you know a factor that he could have an offspring with that wasn't perfect, and um, so she that birth mom was amazing to me. That birth mom's um, mother was a special education teacher, and she said, "I know that there is a life for my son," and so um, she went through special needs adoption in Wisconsin here, and we were very fortunate to be chosen by those parents. And we got to meet them on a one-time basis, you know, first name basis, one time only. And um, when they interviewed us, and um, we're very grateful. He came to us at eight weeks old. I must say though, we, the doctor, we had time then to interview pediatricians that we would want for our son. He was our firstborn. Um, and therefore, we had that opportunity from, I think, a different perspective to interview people, uh, doctors, and saying, okay, how comfortable are you with individuals with differences? And we handpicked our pediatrician, I would say, as a result of that. Thank you very much. All right, Emily, we have a question for you, a couple questions. Um, Emily is a very, very busy young woman. Um, she's involved in lots of activities. And Emily, can you tell us a little bit about some of the activities that you're involved in in the community? Well, in the community, I do small program, Bowshuri, and so we do. And um, and you've gone to school. I go to school. Eighteen twenty program is my final year. I graduated. I am at UW for her. Hospital is that is that close by. It's just through August. And I um, use Special Olympics. My track has started. But it's pretty good. Uh, 22nd. My third is track meet. And Sydney is uh, July. I am basketball. Track, swimming, golf. She's playing softball. 
She's she's a busy young woman, as I said. She does Thank a lot you. of things. Um, I am wondering um, if there's something that the parents would like to tell teachers or school or your providers about your child. There's something specific you want them to know about your child. This, my big thing is always, uh, I, we've seen Kennedy thrive when she's included uh, with her typically developing peers. We're lucky enough to have her at the Weisman Early Childhood Program, uh, which does a you know, wonderful job in leading the nation in terms of inclusive education. But uh, even out in the community, we try to just you know, make sure that we impress upon people that she does better when she's included, the group does better when she's included, and you know, to the extent that she is able to do something with her peers, uh, we just want her to be able to do that. So I always try to keep that inclusion, inclusion focus top of mind for anyone that, that works with her. We really worked on getting Matthew fully included um, in the community along with school. Um, fortunately, it, we happen to be in Stoughton schools and they really have that mindset in regard to full inclusion. Almost to the point that as a parent I had to come in and say, too much inclusion. Um, my son needs to, be, to get literacy and math at his level, not you know the, what was being taught in the classroom and the, he was given a workbook to work on what was at his level. So I had to work with the schools. I'm a speech and language pathologist in the schools also. So I had a kind of an interesting perspective in, um, um, of knowing how to deal with the IEPs and that sort of thing. Um, but we worked really hard of transitioning them into the community activities. We used our part parks and recreation department. Um, and it's interesting now they are actually have adaptive fitness programs now in our community, which is really, really, really nice. Also, they're very supportive of our Special, our Special Olympics program, which um, has grown over those years. It was just bowling, and I thought, just bowling? Now we have year-round sports also in our community, which is really, really nice that Matthew's part of, and I'm a part of, too, as a coach. Um, what do you think? Um, well, I, um, I think I would just say to like give Alyssa time because sometimes she, it just takes her a little time to adjust and adapt to situations and new people. And oftentimes the first impression they may have of her um, doesn't really reflect her full potential. And so being able to just kind of give her time to warm up and not make too many assumptions based on your first interaction with her. Um, it was, we had a very positive experience. Uh, she just started preschool through the school district and the IEP process was, was very positive and I felt very honoring of her and very um, strengths focused. So that was really encouraging. But they didn't really get to see, get to know her. Um, they just got snapshots as they assessed her. But they kind of, in their language, gave her, understood that that was not going to fully reflect her. And, She's just done, you know, really well in school because I feel like they really wanted to hear my husband and I's um, experience with her um, and family members' experiences with her and just, um, and they were able to make determinations based on, you know, getting all the data from a lot of people who know her a lot better than they do. So I feel like that was really helpful and positive and she's had a very positive experience just with all of her providers and the people in the school so far. She's only three, so <laughs> it's still kind of simple, simpler right now. But. All right. Thank you. One of the questions that we had was, how do you respond to challenging behavior and what is the balance between teaching and constantly correcting? Well, Matthew's not up here because of challenging <laughs> behaviors. There was no more cream cheese uh, for his bagels. So therefore, you know, he has decided not to be part of this panel. Um, so yeah, what I did was cho gave him a choice. We could either he could put it, the bagel in the bag because we're going to take it home, or he would. No, no. Not home. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Um, it was not his choice to be part of the panel now anymore anyway. That was just kind of taken away at this point in time. So um, he has Down syndrome, OCD, 
autism, a number of other things that kind of go, you know, along with that. So we're kind of dealing with that. Challenging behaviors. Yeah, there's always a lot of challenging. Choices are really important to give no matter what. Um, respectful responses. Know that you're modeling whatever you're doing. I mean, I see him giving choices to the dog now. <laughs> um, and that sort of thing. And so I'm always kind of checking my own behavior around him because I know he's going to be modeling that. Um, I always have to have my daughter, who is just um, 14 months younger than him, always checking her behavior with him, too, because it's like she'll have outbursts. Is sibling rivalry? Yeah, it's real. Even among adopted kids, you know, it's real. And um, that produces the challenging behavior sometimes, too. I would uh, I'd just add from a different perspective that I sometimes, I think, have a little bit more trouble dealing with challenging behaviors than Kennedy does. Uh, it's just, you know, and I find it invaluable to hear experiences like yours because I just, you know, w we've only been at this for two years and the thought of doing it for another 50, 60, 70 is a little bit overwhelming sometimes. Uh, but, you know, I find it, I find it is important to step back and kind of take, take stock of what's happening and, you know, make sure that you are handling things in the way that you'd like to handle it. Um, well, as I said, my daughter's three, so I feel like right now, and she's our third child, so I just see her as, you know, any other toddler, pretty much. I mean, yeah, right. So, I, I mean, I know that it's a stage. I know that um, uh, I don't, I don't, I guess I don't feel like I need to constantly correct her because um, she's just in that learning stage and just creating... Um, an environment where she feels safe to learn and explore and <coughs> interact and Kayla's actually worked with Alyssa and she um, has done an amazing job of modeling to me just how to take any kind of com form of communication even if it's not like your ideal response <laughs> and and use it you know use it and go with it and honor it rather than wanting to just squash it down and make it go away um, and, you know, I noticed that in her in interactions with Kayla, there were times where I wanted her to respond, you know, in the appropriate way or not do certain things. But I just, I, I loved uh, observing how Kayla would just use those as um, imp moments of empowering her, actually, and just honoring her and respecting her, um, even if it's not what I thought was like the right, you know, you realize there is no like right or wrong way. I'm sure as they get older, it's different. But for where I am right now at three, I'm just trying to live in the present day, the present moment, <laughs> the present conversation, and just stay with her there, you know, and help her try to thrive and grow through there. And if I'm constantly correcting her, that's not going to be a fun environment to thrive and grow and, you know, test things out and learn. So, great. Thank you. Emily, you're an adult now. You're almost 21. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you've um, managed making friends and if you have dipped your toe into the dating scene at all yet? Well, but dating advice is kind of funny. So, dating is school schools for special picks and down syndrome. But dating way for boys and girls are dating, but that's a hard question for me. Mm. Hey, Emily, I think you you were talking about that instead of dating one person, you have a group of friends, right? Yes, I do. And you hang around with them a lot, and you do a lot of I have a lot of small program too, and with Elizabeth and Austin, I do a small program because, you know, they say not or not, because if they not, we'll do some hours too. Yeah, Kate, uh, Emily is part of a program that we have at Gigi's, which is a SMART program, and that we're now, there's been such a great need for our programming for our adults, um, achievement programming, that we've had to um, have us sign up for registration, and so we've developed two more programs, and that's what Emily's going to be part of, as our, our Saturday Fantastic Friends. Yes. Right. Right. And then also we have a cooking group on Wednesdays, 
because of that functional skill? Well, those things is I work with me because, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, this is a uh, guys a cookie class. Right. I get cookie class and commemorations too, but I take this as I take that as a yes for me. I really take both, so that's easy. There's a lot of programs. I know you also are part of on Tuesdays. You're going to be part of through communication and inventions. Tuesdays and Fridays for right now. Oh, Tuesdays and Fridays, right? And there are other social opportunities for you then, right? Yeah, and my community is. This class is a picking class. Or this is class, and was this before? Yeah, so what we're trying to what we're trying to do and we're working as Madge we're working in partnership with Gigi's and with uh, the Down Syndrome Association of Wisconsin is yeah. we're really focusing on bringing programming to the adults in the Down Syndrome community because I think you know what I have seen at least and what I've heard is that we really need more programming for for people as they age out of the children's play groups and the teen groups and and you know work towards becoming adults and uh, I know yeah. Emily's taking advantage of that stuff, and right. we always want to hear more from our adults with Down syndrome about what they want to do. They do like what kids do like um, the youth group is Down syndrome through like release attack going through plus the youth group stuff together. Yeah, and I think that we're you know I think one of the things that we'd highlight is how fortunate we are mm -hmm. uh, to live in a community that has all of these resources. And I think that part of what I like to keep in mind is that not everyone is quite so fortunate. So we're trying, you know, to the extent that we can try to help people that don't have ready access right. to this stuff so that they can thrive like Emily's thriving, and thrive like yeah. Matthew's thriving. And I'm not part of that, uh, group stuff, but the teens all the youth group stuff, play the summer stuff together, do the Broadway class, everything. That's my idea. But parents cannot do the youth group stuff. We are our kids do that too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's one thing that with the SMART program and everything, we're, um, that's just an acronym, okay, um, for the group. But we set goals and then if, every individual sets their goals for what they're going to achieve and in life and um, so that's what we talk about and we our activities are all set up to, toward doing that and yeah they want a voice they want a voice even if they're not using their own voice we have two individuals that are using communication devices to make their their word known um, or their message known or body language oh a lot of bodily language because we have three individuals that have been just recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's because they're in their 50s in our group and um, they express a lot of body language in regard to their displeasure with what's going on and everything and as an adult we have to stand back and listen to them because they they have a lot to communicate and a lot to say about their life and the quality of their life. And Judy I'm wondering we, we had talked previously if you can talk a little bit more about some of the other things that Gigi's is looking at for, for future education and further education for kids transitioning to adulthood. Yeah, um, we're realizing, as was say, stated already, that the programming for our adults is really important, especially as they age out of the school system and don't have that support. Um, so I know uh, Mads has done a wonderful job of coordinating with communication innovations, uh, innovations mm -hmm. excuse me, um, in regard to um, like classes for karate and we had a life skills program last year that was a big success where they helped the individuals kind of develop typical general life skills so that they can maybe transition to living on their own right and then um, I know they have a book club also which is really really nice um, at Gigi's we have um, literacy programming and we would like to in the near future math programming but that also leads into something that we're aiming for in January, and that is what's called Gigi's Prep. And Gigi's Prep is um, for those individuals that are transitioning out of possibly high school or other situations, life situations, and they want to further their education. Okay, and it might be about life skills. They may have to learn a number of different 
maybe they don't know how to tell time yet, you know, so they won't be able to necessarily know what time it is to catch the bus or, or whatever. Or, yeah, what systems are out there for them to transport themselves from destination to next destination. Um, those kind of life skills. Um, but we're hoping to have a, what's called a Gigi's University, which is an internship into different employment situations. Okay, so this is some of our goals and hopes, and they're becoming reality very quickly, very quickly. Um, like I said, we just had the SMART program um, initially and found out that when we got 15 people coming to every, every session, you know, and we were supposed to have a max uh, of 10, we had to start new programming. So we have, and we have fantastic friends on Wednesdays, we have that. Um, Saturday Fantastic Friends now, which is opposite the, the SMART program, right? It's one to three again, so that's always now. Right, so there's three programs now that are there, that are ongoing. We're talking about other programming, so this is a neat area. Um, and let me say, Gigi's is all volunteers except for one paid site coordinator, and now through our speech and language therapist, with, through grants, is, you know, she gets paid. Um, right? Okay. <laughs> and make sure and everything and whatever. And there's some of us who are lifers there that are lifetime volunteers that are supporting the programs there. But um, yeah, I think that's really very, very good. Emily? Um, also a ambassador for Kiki's the Playhouse too. But the mini Kiki's show is a positive too. Talk about it. Oh, about the ambassador uh, program yes. at Gigi's? Yeah, um, Emily's a yeah, ambassador, yeah. as is Matthew, yeah. Yeah, is uh, Maratinus, I think? Oh, you're talking about, um, are you... I'm a pink, pink poodle, amazing for Gigi's, for perhaps. Are you talking about the gala? Yes. Oh, yeah, we have a gala that's coming up in October. It's a fundraiser for, for that. Um, but also, um, hey, about the social things. What about the night to remember that's coming up? Um, number one, I I started in the house, and we dance in our back here. As a kitty, is my sister, so she's back here. So night to remember, at least I told the class, is night to remember is this. It's a major dance, isn't it? A major and dance. Zine driver it rides around the capital, right? Yes. Yes. What else? You get photos. We have photos for. Matthew's already been fitted for his his tux. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that was offered by the community. Yeah, he doesn't have to pay for his tux. He has to pay for his shoes. Uh, well, I like a dress. Well, Gala is pink dress. I'm using it. To wear my shoes, I uh, don't have to pay. Right, your makeup, your makeup is done for you. You get flowers or corsages when you get there. Yeah, the photos are taken, and there's a band so you can dance all night. Yeah, you even have a red carpeted track that you get to walk in on, right? Yeah, and everybody is clapping when you come in. Yes, and I'm about to with. For my group too. Oh, you volunteer at your school? Well, as I email, show a project. Well, one stopping you like kitty's going and show's going, showing up is going. I'm very able to, if that's my little dance, I get your volunteer together. But yeah, so Emily, Emily always has a big appetite to help us out with all of our programming. Uh, at MADS, and she has a lot of great ideas that we're trying to implement, uh, and specifically trying to plug into her, her youth group and some of her other right. social circles to try and again just kind of see what they need, and not to turn this into a plug fest, but the <laughs> night the night to remember is pretty pretty awesome. Uh, MADS is sponsoring the event this year too. It's at the Monona Terrace. I do you know the date offhand? Okay, May six. May six. May May six. six. So it's a. Uh, it's really, really great. All the, the people with Down syndrome, the people with other disabilities, they get to walk the red carpet. There's paparazzi. 
there's an event for young kids beforehand that aren't going to attend the dance, but they can go down the red carpet and take a limo ride around the Capitol Square. So I really encourage you to look into that. This is Larry from Minnesota U.S. Emily, we want to see pictures of you all dressed in this beautiful gown. So, Thank so, you. so often our youth are not part of the prom in high school. Okay, and so this is sort of like a prom forever. I mean, the, you know, and it's so great that this has been. I think it started out in Sun Prairie, right? Yeah, it's, I think it's it was the a Heartland group. Community Church. Yeah, it was a the, church group the that started with us. And they, they yeah, yeah. So it was wonderful. <laughs> and just as a side, because um, I go to Heartland, I'm helping with that. And we do need a lot of volunteers, actually. <laughs> Hosts in particular, people that could um, just escort the, the guests throughout the evening and help with that. Yeah, I don't even get to go this year. Yeah. My, my, husband, my, excuse me, my daughter is escorting my son there, oh, that's awesome. wearing a bridal gown. Yeah. So, p parents, you, you are doing a lot outside of just taking care of your children. You're also volunteering and doing um, things to help push the agenda for um, individuals with Down syndrome. But what are you doing to take care of yourselves? So that's, that's an interesting question. The, uh, I, I feel like we as parents sometimes forget to do that. Uh, and you know, you're super busy, you work, I mean, I know I work a full-time job and then you come home and you want to spend time with your family and then, you know, it's 11 o'clock. Uh, but one of the things that my wife and I have really tried to do is make sure that we carve out time for our own individual interests. So, you know, she has her, uh, her groups and her, her running groups and her other, uh, you know, mom's groups, social groups that she likes to take, take some time off to do. And then she gives me the opportunity to do things too. I'm, I'm a little bit of an introvert, so I like, I love to go to the movies by myself, which is a weird thing to do, right? I, I like to play Xbox. I'm, you know, a big kid. So I just try to take, steal an hour here, steal an hour there. Um, and really what I've tried, I found my outlet uh, to kind of deal with some of the emotions and some of the other issues that come with having a child with a disability is to get involved a little bit more than I would have otherwise been involved. So not just with the MADS things, uh, but I go, I fly out to DC a couple times a year to meet with the congressional delegation to talk about issues impacting the Down syndrome community. And that's fun because it's, it's either a nice getaway with my wife or this past week I was out there and I was by myself, which was a nice getaway for me, but I can kind of couple it with something else that's important to me. So really it's all about finding what's good for you individually. And I really think, I went through a period where I didn't take the time to do that and it was not healthy. So I think that, you know, I would encourage everyone to really think long and hard about what you can do for yourself. Because really if you're happier, I think your kids are gonna be happier and your family's gonna be happier. My husband and I have a weekly date night um, and that was something that the, um, his pediatrician recommended to us. And when we were going through the adoption process, they always recommended having, you know, taking time for yourself. We actually do yoga together. Uh, we take a yoga class uh, while Matthew is at work. Matthew does live in, a, in our home at this point in time. Um, he pays rent. And um, so while he's gone, um, we have yoga that we do. Um, my husband and his retirement now has found that he has found other people that really like to play sheep's head so at the senior citizen center so he does that and and um we go traveling um in our retirement now we travel um twice a year um one time matthew goes along with us um and the other one we go out of the country and it's two or three weeks and fortunately my daughter then is our t our matthew's care provider during those interludes. So um, we've had a lot of support people that have suggested supporting yourself. Nutrition is another big thing. We're really into good nutrition and that sort of thing too. So, um, And I think getting involved is a way to take care of yourself, you know, just that you're not alone. There's a lot of support. There's people that can help you, help your family. Um, I think that's really critical. And I mean, honestly, I, I'm not aware of Alyssa having Down syndrome. It's not like I <laughs> moved throughout my life with that awareness. It's actually when I go to these events and stuff that I'm like, oh, I have a daughter with Down syndrome. Okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think we just got respite, um, like funding for that. And so that has completely, I feel like changed my life. I mean, just having 
a few hours here and there where um, I can take care of things and just um, have more time with my husband. It's been an amazing blessing to have that. So where I wouldn't have normally done that for myself, you know, I mean, you can go find a, hire a babysitter, but it's like, then you question if it's necessary or worth it or, so this just makes it self-care kind of more built in and um, strengthens my marriage, just having more time with him. I just told Joe, I'm like, we're like better friends ever since this happened. <laughs> I'm like getting to know you again. And so it's, that's been really huge. Thank you. So we're getting near time. Um, and I just, again, want to thank everyone that came today to listen and learn about um, our day with the experts and to, again, let's give a big round of applause to our panel. So All right. Thank you, everybody. I hope you have a great afternoon. Yeah.